Good morning, welcome to Not Long History Seminar um, 2021, um, The Hard Road to the Truth. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Pat McCarthy, who's um, chairing our seminar today. Liz Gillis from the Liberties, I'd like to thank her as the Emel de May of History. Um, Tom O'Neill from the Real Republic Park. Tomás Mockenbarra with his new book, The Scar of Martyrs from Clare. And um, Tom Toomey, um, the ever present crusader for Limerick history. Um, today um, has been made more possible by the help of. Um, Limerick County Council and Tony Storen in um, Limerick City Library um, to help us with the streaming. Um, we have two new battalion boards on display, um, so hopefully we'll open up that to the public to see um, at some point when restrictions allow. Um, the Flying Columns um, Battalion Board and the Brigade Command. Um, there is lots of books on sale here today if anybody gets the chance to pop in. Um, and I'd just like to say we still have these books available, The Rescue of Sean Hogan and Honouring the Men and the Women um, in East and Mid Limerick, the Independence Volunteers. Um, today, we'd like to um, dedicate this seminar to Stan O'Brien, the son of John Joe O'Brien, who was involved in the rescue um, of Sean Hogan at the station in Not Long. Um, and this is Stan's book, John Joe's Story. Um, he came here a lot and we fondly remember him. Um, so I'll hand you over to Dr. Pat McCarthy. Um, thanks, Mary. And first of all, thanks to Knock Long, to the committee, to Tom and his committee here, who've organized this event. And it is wonderful, it is a sure sign that we're coming back to something approaching normality, that there are live people here. And I can assure you, from a personal point of view, I'd rather talk to two people in a hall than to 200 on Zoom, but that's just me. But again, many thanks on behalf of all of us who are speaking uh, for the invitation to come here. Mary mentioned Stan O'Brien who died on Tuesday in Our Lady's Hospice in Dublin. I don't know how long Stan lived in Ratgar in Dublin, but I think in truth it could be said that he never left Limerick. He never left Galbally, and his heart, his soul were there all the time. Limerick, and he was devoted to Limerick, and it's especially its history. I had the pleasure of meeting him once I called to his house in Ratgar to buy a copy of the book um, about his father, John Joe, John Joe's story. And I have to say, over a, I had a wonderful morning over a cup of coffee with nice biscuits as we talked about the War of Independence, we talked about various aspects of it and so on like that. And I came away from that very brief meeting thinking, I had really met a scholar and a gentleman, a true scholar and an absolute gentleman. It was a privilege to have met him. And I think for a moment we remember him. Now, on today's seminar, the organizers have picked a brilliant title the rocky road to the truth. And it was a very rocky road. And what I want to do is to put the events that are covered in today's lectures in the context of the war of independence. Now, who am I to say that we all know that the war of independence began at Salahed Beg and was continued on at Knock Long. So we date it from January 1919. But in truth, if the truth be known, as a war, it was slow to develop. In 1919, a total of, I think, 15 policemen were killed throughout the country and one British soldier in Fermoy. And the policemen that were killed, it was in 
Limerick here, in Tipperary, in Clare, and in Dublin, the targeted assassinations of the G-men in Dublin. Now, I would suggest to you that that death toll, 15 policemen and one British soldier in a year, was not going to influence British policy one way or the other. The British had decided that this was, in their term almost, an acceptable level of violence. It's what was expected in Ireland. And that it would be put down by the police. So it was a police matter. And even though the violence began to increase throughout 1920, it was still, as far as the British were concerned, a police matter. So when, what did they do? They reinforced the police. The Black and Tans started to arrive in March. In June, General Sir Neville Macready, the GOC of the British Army in Ireland, sent a proposal to London asking that he be allowed to recruit eight extra battalions of a thousand men each who would, garrison, who would control the barracks, the garrisons, allow his regular troops to be more aggressive. And the government, the British government, turned it down because, as far as they were concerned, it was a police matter try and keep the army out of it. So what did they do? They recruited 1,500 auxiliaries, the ex-British officers, again police. And that was reflected very much even in October and November in speeches by Lloyd George. In October, speaking at Carnarvon, he said, we cannot have a one-sided war. In Ireland, harmless-looking citizens might pass a policeman in the street. When he had passed the policeman, he would pull out a revolver and shoot him in the back. Scores of policemen had been killed that way. That was war, not murder. Sorry, that was not war, but murder. If there's war, give the soldier and the policeman a fair chance. And he then went on to defend reprisals. Policemen do not go burning houses and shooting men without provocation. I think during the last year, 283 policemen have been shot in Ireland, 109 shot dead. The police endured this state of things in a way that is the highest testimony to their discipline and self-restraint. There is no doubt that at last our patience was, has given way and there has been some severe hitting back. And he went on a month later to talk about having murder by the throat, that the policemen were winning. But I would suggest to you that November changed 1920, changed everything. It redefined the war. November was a bloody month, to put it mildly. Up to then, in the worst months of 1920, Perhaps 60, 70 people may have been killed, soldiers, policemen, IRA, civilians, each month. But in November 1920, 176 people were killed. That's nearly six every day. And it wasn't just the big events, the Bloody Sundays, the Kilmichaels, but throughout the day, throughout that month, there was an appalling litany of violence. Ellen Griffin, a mother, sitting with her baby in her arms and expecting another child, was shot by a passing policeman. And when it was raised in the House of Commons, Hamer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, said, the policemen are entitled, if they think there might be an ambush, they are entitled to shoot in advance. That's a recipe for free fire, for shooting at anything and everything. And the police certainly took advantage of it. And there was a chronicle, a litany. And we'll hear about the Scar of Martyrs. And we can think of the two of the Howran, or sorry, the Hulan brothers killed
by being dragged after lorries in Galway. And we can think of others apart from Bloody Sunday. And that scale of violence spread throughout the whole country, influenced the um, British government hugely. And let me give you another thought. The British people, and in particular the British government, from their vast empire, were used to the occasional soldier being killed and the relatives being notified. But 14 British officers being killed on one Sunday morning, and each one of them coming home, and a state memorial service in Westminster Abbey, that affects the British people far more. 17 ex-officers being killed at Kilmichael and brought back en masse to be buried in England. That affected the publicity. And really, you see a huge change in the War of Independence from November on. It becomes a military conflict. And it's really, and in that military conflict, you get the use of internment, you get martial law, you get massive roundups, reinforcement of the military. It becomes more of a military struggle, and that precipitates even greater levels of violence throughout 1921. Now, it also, and I'm, I'll come back to this at the end, November 1920, for the first time, precipitated a willingness to speak to Sinn Féin by the British government. For the very first time, they are willing to talk. There's beginning to be a recognition in the British government that they're fighting an unwinnable war. But it would take another seven months of bloody mayhem. Now, we have some key incidents in that period to be talked about. The first is one of the very high profile incidents, the Customs House. And we have here Liz. Liz, historian, author, historian in residence in, with Dublin South County Council, the, um, and also a researcher for the RT History Show. She has written about six books, including Women of the Irish Revolution, and critically, The Burning of the Customs House, 1921, which she wrote in collaboration with Michal Divlin. And in 2018, she received the Lord Mayor's Award for her contribution to history. So here to talk to us about the Customs House burning, how it was done, and what a major operation it was, it's my great pleasure to introduce Liz. Thanks, Liz. Thanks a million, Pat. And um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Tom and everyone for organising today's event. And um, it's great to have been asked to take part, and it's actually great to be in person. So, uh, yeah, um, we'll get going. And I just moved us backward and forward, yeah? So um, I suppose um, I do have to say a huge, huge thank you for the slides in this presentation. Um, Pat did mention me, Hall of Divilene. Um, we've been researching the Custom House, the operation for no, well over... 14 years now, um, and Michal was responsible for these slides there, and nothing to do with me, so a huge thank you to Michal. But I suppose um, the, when we look at the customers, the arguments that have been made about the, the operation on the 25th of May 1921 is that the Dublin Brigade of the IRA were wiped out, um, the census records were destroyed, Michael Collins was against the whole idea, and it was a complete disaster in terms of the IRA losses. Now, originally, before I started looking at the custom house, um, I would have been of those opinions. But myself and Michal, we actually did a, a talk for yourself, Pat, with the Military uh, Society way back in 2010. And we started looking um, at this operation. Um, it was due to a photo album that had been discovered in Kilmainham Jail. Myself and Michal worked as guides there. And um, we had all these names of these, these men, these volunteers, but didn't know who they were. Um, and thankfully, the Bureau of Military History, the witness statements had been released. And it turns out that the men that were in this 
photo album had actually been prisoners in Kilmainham Jail because of the operation and um, the burning of the Custom House on the 25th of May. Um, but what the men themselves were saying was very different to what historians had been saying. As in, they were saying they were not defeated, this was not a disaster, and that pricked up our ears, and hence this, this journey of, of years and years in research um, began. So I suppose, looking back on why it happened, so we do have to go back to 1920. Eamon de Valera had been in America for the, pretty much the duration of the War of Independence and the way he saw the events in Ireland being portrayed was very different to what was happening on the ground in Ireland. Internationally, the media reporting that the IRA were assassins, they were murderers, it was murder gangs that were roaming around the place, this was not a war. And what we do have to remember is that propaganda was such an important weapon in this war. So we returned at the end of uh, 1920 to Ireland and he calls a meeting of the Army Council together which included people like, sorry just go back, which included people like Michael Collins, Cattle Brew, Rich Mulcahy, all the big names um, in the IRA leadership and he put forth his plans um, that it shouldn't be ambushes and assassinations, the IRA needs to engage in big operations um, certainly in Dublin and two targets that were put forward for um, attack were Beggars Bush Barracks and that was the headquarters of the auxiliaries in Dublin and also the Custom House. Now, and the reason that he wanted to, for the IRA to engage in large scale attacks was so that it would highlight internationally what was happening in Ireland, a major offensive in the capital was needed. Now, the IRA leadership um, in Dublin, the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, they were tasked with sussing out which target was the best one to attack Beggar's Bush. They, they wrote that off immediately because the auxiliaries, it they were too alarmed it would be a suicide mission for the IRA so then they turned their focus to the, the Custom House which was the, the symbol of British civil administration in Ireland. Now we know that the, the Sinn Féin had won uh, the general election but the real power lay in local government and in 1920 Sinn Féin had swept the board in the local and rural elections um, all across pretty much the country. But what was held in the Custom House, just a, a sample of the, the departments that were held there. So basically you have all the tax files for Ireland. You have the government departments being inland revenue, local government, very importantly, um, state duty control registers, the stamp office, income tax and joint stump, stock company registers. Now if they destroyed the contents. So the whole objective was to actually destroy the contents of the building, the records, because the British administration functioned on paper, not to destroy the actual building. And if they pull this off, basically its destruction would reduce the most important branch of British civil government in Ireland to virtual impotence and would, in addition, inflict on our financial loss of about £2 million. So destroy the records. Now, the thing is, the the Custom House was always in the sights of the IRA and it's down to this man here, Dick McKee, who was the, the Commandant, the OC of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA. Way back in 1918, he wanted to attack the Custom House. This was in response to the threat of conscription. The volunteers, <coughs> they were not well armed. They were only reorganising. Um, they didn't attack the Custom House because conscription wasn't introduced. He again resurrects the plan in 1920. Um, for some reason he has a bee in his bonnet about the Custom House, I don't know why. But he put that plan forward in front of GHQ, so Collins and Mulcahy and all are there. And they didn't sanction it in 1920, not because they didn't agree that it was a bad idea. It's just that the IRA, GHQ, had something much bigger in mind. And that was to attack the local income tax offices all across the country. And they do that on the night of the 4th of April 1920. It's the 4th anniversary of the rising, the British government, where they had an idea something might happen, got it completely wrong, the whole country went on fire. And if the IRA didn't know where the copies of the local records were, they soon found out because it was announced in the newspapers that all of the copies of those income tax uh, records, they were all housed neatly in the Custom House. Again in 1920, if members of the 4th Battalion of the Dublin Brigade, they go in to the Custom House, there was an armoury there, and they went in to seize weapons. Um, they went in at lunchtime, and um, a number of IRA men either worked in the Custom House or in and around the Custom House, knew the routine. Um, that particular day when Paddy O'Brien went in, 
the number of soldiers had been increased, so they pulled back. Now, what you do find is that elements of those plans from 1918, 1920, and later 1920 are all culminated when it comes to the attack, the planning of the attack on the 25th of May. So they've agreed they're going to attack the Custom House. So how would they find out what the lay of the land was like? So you had information coming from the men inside. But Oscar Trainer seen here, so he was the OC of the Dublin Brigade after Dick McKee was murdered in Dublin Castle on Bloody Sunday. He went around easily. He got in, no problem. Um, he walked around with an official looking envelope and was able to carry out surveillance. His, the man he was going to put in charge of the operation was Tom Ennis. He was OC of the 2nd Battalion, and because the Custom House was in their area, it's going to be a 2nd Battalion job. Um, he went in, same thing, carrying an envelope, and was freely able to walk around the building and see where everything was. Um, maps were coming from the National Library, from repositories in England. The engineers, Liam O'Flaherty, um, he got uh, maps and sent them to Oscar Trainer and so on to plan the operation. And as I mentioned before, very importantly from inside, you have Harry Colley, who was a member of the IRA, but also worked in the Custom House, and he gives vital information to um, Oscar Trainer. and it was that the Wills Room, which was under the dome, that should be targeted because that would act like a, a, a chimney if they set fire to the building there. And also the Wills room, um, it was pretty much floor to ceiling wood, so it was one of the most combustible parts of the building. So you've got all of this information coming in freely. So what was the plan? And as I said, they took elements of the previous plan, so it would take place at lunchtime because it wasn't unusual to see groups of men going in and out of the building. Also, there wouldn't be as many people in the building because they would be going out to lunch. But whereas it's a second battalion job, let's go back to that, um, as in they would be the ones inside the building, you had all of the Dublin brigades involved in this, this operation. It is massive. So the first battalion would be protecting or providing protective cover in the immediate area outside the Custom House. You have the 3rd Battalion, they'd be occupying the fire stations in their area because that is a key part of this plan. The 1st Battalion would also take over the fire stations in their area. 4th Battalion, some of them would be on Book Bridge, giving uh, protective cover as well as taking over the fire stations in their area. And then we have the 5th Battalion. So they were the engineers. And that was made up of men from all of the, the city battalions. And they, for weeks, had been going down the, 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 um, the, the sewers and so on, trying to isolate communications from the Custom House, locating where they were from the Custom House to Dublin Castle. And at the moment that the volunteers would go into the Custom House, the 5th Battalion, the engineers, were to cut communications. So this was the plan. It would take place, as I said, at lunchtime. 12.55 it would begin. And it was time to take place for about 25 minutes. A very, very quick operation. Um, and just to break down the engineers for you, in all, you had 16 men cutting wires, 6 men at Barrister Place Office, 2 men at the Custom House Post Office, and 8 men as an outside guard. So again, 25 minutes was the time allowed. And what they would do at that time after coming from all parts of the city, the main group, the 2nd Battalion, with the squad supported by, with Active Service Unit as well, go into the Custom House. Um, the staff would obviously have to be gathered up and they would be held in the, uh, the, the central hall on the ground floor. In the meantime, you had the other members of the 2nd Battalion, the main body. They were given um, a lot of rooms, so places that they were all to go to and they would prepare the rooms for firing. Paraf was to be soaked um, or to be put all over the documents. Petrol was too inflammable, it was too volatile, it was too dangerous, so paraffin was the preferred um, accelerant that was used. They were to close all the windows, smash all the presses, get it all ready, and then they were to report back to Tom Ennis. So as, as OC of the 2nd Battalion, he is in the building with them. They would report to him, say the rooms are ready to go, ready to be fired, and he would give one single whistle blast. And then when the rooms were fired, when the evacuation was ready to take place, two whistle blasts would be the signal to go. So no one was meant to have a whistle apart from Tom Ennis. And 
that's pretty much the, the way it ran. Um, and to show that it wasn't going to be a long drawn engagement or that there was going to be a gun battle, the volunteers inside, they had a revolver and six rounds of ammunition. Now the thing is, you might think that it's a very quick operation, it's a lot to take on. We see all of the men pretty much that had taken part or were going to take part in this operation had already been involved in a huge attack uh, on the LNWR Hotel in April. So they were very used to this quick action of hit, run and disappear. Um, so again, Tom Ennis is in charge of it. And a crucial point, and this is where the, the mistakes sort of do happen, and it's not down to the men that are planning it, it's down to another person, and we'll get to that now in a second. But basically, using the tactics that they had used successfully in that attack on the LNWR Hotel, there had been major protective cover provided for the IRA that were attacking that hotel. So they isolated the bridges. So it meant that the military could not get in to help Q Company of the Auxiliaries who are based in um, that hotel. So that was quite successful. So it makes complete sense that they would utilise those same tactics. And this is what Dick McKee had planned in 1918, 1920. That while the Custom House was being attacked, you would have all of the other battalions of the IRA, they would isolate the military barracks. So barricades would be erected in the streets near the barracks around the city. And it meant that if the military were alerted to the fact that the custom house was being attacked, then they would meet the IRA at those barricades. So it would delay them from getting in. Um, it was Michael Collins who vetoes that part of the plan. He thought that if barricades were erected all across the city, it would look like an insurrection. We're going back to 1916, and he says, no, not going to happen. Um, also, the number of men that were to be used, it is said 120 men. He thought that was too many. As it turns out, there was an awful lot more that were involved in this operation. Um, but if they would, could not carry out this attack without that issue of setting up those barricades, it wasn't going to happen at all. So Oscar Trainer doesn't push him on it. A compromise was reached that the 1st Battalion, members of the active service unit from the 3rd and 4th Battalion, they would provide that protect, protective cover outside in that immediate vicinity. And that meant that they didn't have that space. If they had been out, even up at O'Connell Bridge or further, they could have delayed the military. That's where the crucial mistake is here. And it was Collins that did that. Um, so, getting back to the number of men, 120, that's the second battalion. So that is those who are going to be in the building, actually carrying out the setting fire to the building, supported by members of the squad and the active service unit. But at the moment, um, we have discovered close to at least 280 people, including four women, at least four women, had a role to play in this operation. So it's a huge, huge operation. And it has been said that De Valera, when it was put forward to him, that if this operation went wrong and those men were lost, well, he basically said if 120 men were lost and the job accomplished, um, the sacrifice would be well justified. Colin said something along similar, line, similar lines as well. So they're going to burn the, the contents. What are they going to need? So it was a lot of material, including 280 tins of paraffin oil, um, two bales of cotton waste, tins obviously to carry the paraffin, hatchets, bolts, cutters and transport to actually transport the paraffin to, it, um, to the building. And who was instrumental in providing that information in the planning was, of course, the Dublin Fire Brigade, many of whose members were either IRA men or members of the Irish Citizen Army. And we'll come back to them, to them later on. So basically, the date is set, 25th of May. Um, the time is set, 12.55. And you have from about, <coughs> about 20 to 1, you have all of these men just beginning to descend on the custom house, mainly dressed up as workmen um, to basically cover the fact of what they were actually going to do. You have Jim Foley. He's one that arrives um, in one of the lorries because they had a number of lorries. And he arrives, taking the lorry from Findlaters on O'Connell Street, and he arrives uh, to deliver the, the paraffin. And at that time, you do have the volunteers. As soon as the lorry arrives, they come, they get the paraffin, and the coolie, they enter into the custom house. Um, at the very same time, you have the fire stations being occupied by members of the IRA, both within the city and then further afield, Rat Mines and Pembroke. 
So that's all going to plan. Again, at the same time, the engineers come into action. Once they see the lads going into the building, you have um, Michael Kremen, um, he's one of the engineers, and right in front of Store Street Police Station, which is literally in front um, of the customers, you can see it. Um, he climbs a 60-foot pole and he, he cuts the line. Um, now, there were police in the vicinity, and a number of them were accosted by the IRA. Uh, Jim Slattery takes one of them into custody. Um, but this is all happening. It's going to plan. Now, we are very, very lucky to have a lot of uh, testimonies from people that were involved, but also there are some accounts of civilians that were there at the time, including Daniel McAleese, and his witness statement is brilliant. And what he says, he explains what it was like at that moment. And he was in the dining room on the ground floor when the attack happened, and he says that he looked towards the door and saw that three young men had entered the room with pointed revolvers and had ordered all the occupants to put a hand hands up, where a hand extends above her head, they are marched out in single files to the corridor, where we joined a number of others, both the staff and the public. Several young men passed carrying tins of petrol. One of the leaders announced that the custom house was being set on fire and warned us against causing any commotion. Now, another employee, they stated, I was held up by a number of young men who were armed. They prevented me from going upstairs and placed me in the vestibule where a number of other officials and lady members of the staff had been gathered. A constant stream of boxes, each containing about four tins of petrol, were carried in with as much coolness as if they were boxes of stationery. They were quickly opened and the contents carried to various portions of the building. Several of the staff attempting to leave the building were prevented. And again, we have a girl that was working in the custom house, and she said that the volunteers allowed them to take their possessions. And they were brought downstairs to the main hall, so guarded by the active service unit and the squad, and then to a back corridor towards the gate that opened out onto the custom house base. And so the road that's there now, it, it didn't exist at the time. And she continued that there were four of the custom house luncheon staff and four lady clerks and a large number of men clerks. The latter, for some reason, were forbidden to smoke. They're going to set it on fire, obviously, and the raiders ranged up bicycles belonging to the staff nearby, ready to hand out when we're leaving. And they got ready to open the gate. Then those at the gate shouted to the staff, back, back, and there came a tremendous volley from outside the gate. Now, obviously, gathering up, there was a large number of staff in the building, um, so that took a bit of time um, to gather all the staff downstairs. Somehow, uh, word was sent to the military in Dublin Castle. Um, they do make their way down. That happened at about 10 past one. So we don't know whether it was a passing policeman or we have the, the, the caretaker Taker, um, Davis, the housekeeper, um, and he was actually trying to, to make contact with Dublin Castle and he was shot by Jimmy Conroy uh, for trying to do so. He didn't obviously get to, to make that call, but word reached Dublin Castle anyway and the military were sent down to investigate. And the IRA had been told, do not open fire on the military if they passed, because the military were driving around Dublin City all the time. Um, it was only if the military opened fire the IRA were to react outside, but we do have a volunteer that admits that he did open fire on them because as the military, as the auxiliaries passed down by Liberty Hall and come around onto Barrister Place, they did see a bit of smoke coming from one of the windows and they slowed down. Um, and the volunteer thought that basically they were going to get off and attack um, the lads inside, and he opened fire. Um, and then all hell breaks loose outside. So you have the men prepared in the rooms inside. Um, they have to stop doing that, and they run to the windows, and they engage in this gun battle with the auxiliaries um, and then the IRA inside. But the other thing is, the auxiliaries are sort of sandwiched between the IRA in the building, but then those from the 4th Battalion surrounding Beresford Place. Um, you have, during that time, a whistle blast was heard. Now, the thing is, it wasn't Tom Ennis that blew this whistle. Um, I don't know for sure who did. Um, it has been suggested. A few people have been suggested. But a volunteer hears the whistle blast, runs to Ennis and says, I'm not ready. Ennis sends him back. And that caused, again, another slight delay. Um, so the gun battle ensues. And then, finally, the rooms are ready to be fired. Now, in the meantime, 
what happens outside, you have, of course, um, the, the, the military, the auxiliaries are armed to the teeth. You have inside, panic is setting in again. We have Daniel McAleese's account where he talks about it, like the upper rooms that are heavily on fire and as the thick and smoke descended to our congested quarters in the corridor, the atmosphere became almost unbearable. So the fire is being lit. You've got the gunfire going outside. There are shouts and screams to open the door. At this stage, there was heavy machine gun and rifle fire outside, the crowd became panicky and hysteria raged. Caught between the smoke and fire inside and the gunfire outside, the crowd were clamouring to get outside. As the smoke and fumes became almost overpowering, the volunteers tried to quiet the people, telling them that all would be well and that they would shortly be allowed to leave. This advice was of little avail as the smoke drenched downstairs in an unending column accompanied by the cracking of burning woodwork. Now, the building's on fire. And what is the first thing you're going to do? What any citizen would do? You ring the fire station. And that did happen. And the phone calls were answered very coolly, very calmly. Help is on the way. Yes, don't worry about it. We're on the way. What the people didn't know, of course, was the fire stations were in the hands of the IRA. Tower Street Fire Station, the closest fire station to uh, the Custom House. Joe Connolly, and huge thank you to Lars Fallon for, for, for all this information. Um, he was the one that had given them the, the information on how to set the fire. He's the one that let the IRA K Company tour the battalion into Tara Street Fire Station. Um, it took the auxiliaries, the, the police, a long time, about 40 minutes, like when the operation was pretty much over, they realised that there was no firemen coming from Tara Street and then they eventually make their way over. Um, but the thing was, there's a great description of the police are on one side of the door trying to get into to the fire station. And inside, you've got Joe Connolly barreling the, the IRA men into the ambulance, and he literally drives out as the, um, as the police get, make their way into the building. And he got them to a safe place, and then he arrives at the custom house. And I'm using big inverted commas here to put out the fire, because he and his comrades do the complete opposite. Um, Thomas Street Fire Station. The IRA were told there, steal the fire engine. Now, Dublin City was tiny at that time. so. You have Delia Young, a member of Coming and Mon, lived in the fire station, so she's basically there to let the lads in. Um, she cuts the alarm, she takes the guns off the lads, they get dressed up as firemen, and they drive the fire engine out as far as Crumlin. Now, Crumlin's like, you know, a 10 minute walk from Thomas Street, um, but they kept it out for two hours. That meant that fire engine could not get in to put out the fire. Um, it was replicated all over, so the IRA in control of the fire stations. Now, what was happening back at the custom house? So, you have the gunfire or the gun battle going on. You have the men outside engaging with the military. And then we come to Dan Head, volunteer. He was 17 years old, about to turn 18. Um, very active volunteer, experienced volunteer. He was a member of the, the 2nd Battalion. Two people that were outside were Paddy O'Daly and Oscar Trainer. Oscar Trainer obviously watching, wants to see what was going on. Paddy O'Daly tried to get into the building. He was uh, one of the squad. He was also um, one of very, very close to Collins. He was meant to take part, be inside, but couldn't get in. The door he went to was locked. So they're on the outside underneath the loop line bridge. And they're right in the sights of the auxiliaries of the military. Now, what Dan had, the way he fought, what particularly was that he would throw grenades at military tenders passing by. He was known for doing this. He sees two of his officers basically in the sights of the auxiliaries, and that's exactly what he does. Um, he throws a, a grenade into the tender, and um, this causes a lot of damage. This is where the auxiliaries are wounded, and in that moment that gives Trainer and O'Daly the chance to escape. They're safe. They get away. Um, the photograph, of course, you see there is of Dan Head then lying dead on the street um, as a result of that action because he was killed uh, shortly after it. So the building, the rooms are on fire. Um, the volunteers with six rounds of ammunition obviously not going to last long. Um, but the fire had taken hold. So Tom Ennis, he gives the, the order, leave get out. Um, two choices, either try and make your way out this, your own, um, by yourself, get out, or mix in with the staff. Um, and a lot of the men take that option, but there were a few that couldn't, including Tom Ennis. Um, you have Jimmy Slattery and you've got Sean Doyle, two, two extremely wanted men, so they just decided, no, let's take our chances. 
They make a dart out. Two of them get shot. Sean Doyle gets shot in the lung. Jimmy Slattery gets shot in the hand. Both of them end up at the Matter Hospital. Jimmy Slattery ends up losing the hand, and Sean Doyle is obviously, obviously one of the five that dies um, as a result of the operation. Tom Ennis, he's the last to leave the building. He gets out as he's making his way across to a lane where he gets shot twice, horrifically wounded, manages to get home, and um, even the nurse did say that, or the doctor, that they'd never seen injuries like it, but he himself did survive his wounds. But what for those inside? So you had the auxiliaries, they'd gained entrance into the building. Now the caretaker had been, or the housekeeper had been, uh, killed by the IRA. But then inside, once the auxiliaries gain entrance, you then have um, Mahan Lawless, who was a clerk that worked in the, the custom house, and he was shot by the auxiliaries. They thought that he was involved in the operation. Um, you have two civilians that are shot in the crossfire outside. But how did the staff, or how did the IRA mix in with the staff? Um, they did, but what they didn't reckon on was that the, the supervisors were told by the auxiliaries, pick out who's your staff, pick out who, who you know. Um, now, this photograph is of IRA men, definitely IRA men, after the identifications have taken place uh, right in front of the, the custom house underneath the Loop Line Bridge. But I love this photograph. So basically, as the staff are coming out, there's loads of these photographs of you know, staff walking out with their, their hands above their heads and their supervisors saying, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. But this photograph, you can clearly see who's IRA and who's a civilian, because those who are most likely volunteers, you've got this guy, um, where is he, I don't know if this, uh, I don't know if the pointer works, but basically he's the guy in the extreme right and the hat is down. Um, he, oh, I'm after stopping this, sorry. <laughs> Can you go back to that one, Finn? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so basically, if you see it, is, he's hiding his face with the hat, like he's, he's holding his face down so he can't be identified. But then you will see that there are people, clearly, they're looking straight at the soldiers and it's like to say, I'm not involved in this at all. But what you had was close to 100 IRA men were taken into custody. The majority of them were taken to Arbor Hill Prison. Some were taken to Dublin Castle. Uh, you didn't want to be interrogated there. Um, and a number of them, approximately 12, were taken to Mount Joy. And those that were taken to Mount Joy, the authorities knew about them. They were the ones that would be later charged. So you got the likes of Ned Breslin, Johnny Wilson, um, and so on. But after being held in Arbor Hill Prison, the majority were then taken to Kilmainham Jail. And that was like a holding area, a holding prison. So anyone awaiting trial or so on, um, that's where they were brought to. And we're just coming up to it here. Brilliant. So yeah, you can see in those photographs, you can clearly see who's IRA and who is civilian. So there we have them being taken to Arbor Hill Prison. The battle was over. Um, now, the whole objective, uh, so Eamon de Valera destroyed the records. That objective definitely was achieved. And you can see here from this photograph, just this, this clerk is just going through what was lost. Um, you have five volunteers being killed, four on the day, and one dies five days later. Um, some handguns were lost, not all, because the, the fire brigade, as you see, um, were crucial, instrumental in this operation. They actually retrieved an awful lot of weapons after the operation. Um, the thing was, if you can imagine that that day, the, the British authorities, the Crown forces, there they've got over, well, 100 guys, pretty much what they think is the entire Dublin Brigade in custody. Five are dead, or four are dead at the moment. And it must look to them like we've crushed, we've crushed them. The IRA in Dublin are gone. That night, the IRA were back out on the attack. Um, Sean Doyle, as he lay dying in the Matter Hospital, and we have the quote here, his one fear was that the boys were beaten. Um, and that night, as the sounds of a nearby explosion shook the air, Sean's face reeled and smiles, and he turned to the nun who was attending him, and he feebly whispered, thank God, sister, the fight goes on. The IRA adapted very, very, very quickly. Um, it was the second battalion that was mostly affected by the losses that day. Third, fourth, fourth, and fifth. Um, um, Liam O'Flaherty says it, Joseph O'Connor says it, we were not affected by the losses on the, or of the Custom House that day. Now the Fire Brigade, and just to show you, okay, so this is the Custom House, 
when the fire brigade arrived. So you can see there is smoke billowing out, okay? And this is the custom house after the fire brigade arrived. Now, they were the ones that were to go in and put out the fire. Put it this way, and again, huge thanks to Laz Fallon, who's done all the research on the fire brigade and really told their story. In the East Horizon, they could put out the fires in O'Connell Street in less than 24 hours. That one building burned for nearly 10 days, and that was down to the fire brigade. As they went in, they saw rooms weren't on fire, and they set them alight. They found four volunteers, they got back to Tara Street Fire Station with uniforms, brought them back and managed to dress up the volunteers, get them out um, uh, to safety. Also, the weapons. So they were finding the weapons in that were dumped by the IRA. I think it was Joseph Rogers and Michael Smart, and they're hiding them in their helmets, they're hiding them down their boots. Um, there was one auxiliary, a bit suspicious, he goes to a fireman, he's like, what are you doing? And the, the chief, um, it was, uh, oh, not um, Myers, Captain Myers, he comes over and says, what are you doing to my fireman? And he's trying to do his job. So the custom house, the building is destroyed because of the fire brigade. And the auxiliaries got blamed on it. Um, there's examples, records of uh, or, sorry, um, civil service men, the supervisors going in, doing an audit on what was lost. And there was one guy, there were two safes in his room. One was smashed, contents was destroyed, but the other safe was intact and the records were fine. He went back in a few days later, that safe had been smashed open and the contents were destroyed and the auxiliaries got the blame. No one ever imagined it would be the fire brigade. So, in terms of international attention, the newspapers are full of reports about this operation, from the, the big newspapers to the smallest newspapers in America, England, Ireland. It has the effect, what De Valera was looking for, international eyes would focus on Ireland, and that exactly did happen. And it's not that the, the Custom House is the operation or is the event that leads to the, the truce being declared, but I would argue it is one of the events, because despite the fact that you have over 100 men arrested, the IRA kept going. Um, you have the, the burning of the shell factory in June. They, they changed their methods and their targets. The IRA were also uh, aware that um, if you take out the supplies, um, it cost the military more. A horse was worth more to the military than a soldier. So you have with the Shell Factory, the IRA, again, two men operation, fire brigade help again, um, and they take out a number of armoured cars, they destroy them, and military tenders. It was a huge, huge blow. So the IRA definitely not defeated. And the men, once the truce was declared in July 1921, they're in Clemenum. They had been treated as common criminals, but as one of the terms of the truce, anyone in terms, they were given prisoner of war status. Now you can see these guys in these photographs, they're, they're not in bad health. They had um, Irish language classes, they were putting on plays, they were allowed to get food and parcels from home. They even had like a handball uh, tournament. Um, it was the regime relaxed slightly and the autograph books. From these autograph books, we get the words of the men who are very proud to have been involved in this operation. They call themselves the Custom House Fire Brigade. And here they are on their release because the treaty was signed in December 1921. And again, one of the terms of the treaty was that those being held in prison were to be released. And on the 8th of December, from the 8th of December, you have the Custom House Fire Brigade being released from Comanum. And here we see them. They're all well rested. Um, they're, they're all fine. Those who are held in Mountjoy Jail, they're released around January because they had been tried. Now, the losses, and there were losses, and five volunteers did die as a result of that operation. So we have Dan Head, um, about to turn 18 years old, and um, we have Edward Dorans, we have the brothers Patrick and Stephen O'Reilly, and of course Sean Doyle, who died on the 30th of May. His brother Patrick was one of the um, six men that was executed in Mountjoy Jail in March 1921. But the men themselves, they never felt ashamed of this operation, any of them that took part. If there was a criticism, it was that they were too close to give effective protective cover. 1948, a memorial committee was set up. In 1956, the 25th anniversary of the operation, you have the memorial being unveiled um, outside the Custom House. Um, and we're very lucky to be in contact with so many relatives of these men. So that remembrance has, um, it does continue um, um, right up to today. So I suppose going back to the arguments, 
um, and to answer for well, my answer to those arguments. So De Valera, that's a dev idea. He wasn't the first to suggest it. Dick McKee was the original one to, to suggest they attack the Custom House. The objective was, was achieved. The records were destroyed. The building, that's because of the fire brigade. International attention, it did highlight Ireland. It put Ireland on the map. The IRA being destroyed in Dublin. So, OK, you have 100 men that are arrested. Five volunteers are lost. They lost a lot more men in different operations, but over 4,000 full and part-time members of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA were still free, and they carried on the fight. The active service unit was reorganised, and the IRA changed their methods. This, now, the, the big issue is the records that were destroyed, the census records, and I do think that there is confusion between the four courts in 22 and what goes up and the Custom House, but in terms of the Custom House and the census records, they were destroyed long before the IRA got in. They were actually destroyed. They were pulped for paper during the First World War. Um, no one had checked that copies were made. If copies were made, copies weren't made. And they destroyed the originals for paper. So long gone before the IRA went in in May uh, 21. The Dev Collins argument, Collins is against it. Dev is for it. I honestly do believe that has more to do with civil war politics because Collins himself is seen down at the Custom House. He was very impressed with the outcome of the day's operation and a complete disaster. The IRA were not wiped out. The objective was achieved um, and the IRA did continue the campaign. And the thing is as well, from our vantage point 100 years later, we have the luxury of arguing this, saying these men were wrong, they shouldn't have done this and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we have to listen to the men who, who took part in it. We cannot ignore what they say. And I have, have thankfully been so lucky to have read the testimonies. Thankfully, these men left testimonies um, and reports and accounts of that day. And from them, from their stories, their words, they didn't say it was a disaster. And they are the men of the Custom House Fire Brigade. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for that absolutely riveting and stimulating examination of the Customs House operation, giving us an idea of the sheer scale of it, the numbers involved, the intensity of the planning that went into it. And behind the Custom House in the garden there, there is a monument to the men of the Dublin Brigade, in particular to the five men who fell during that operation. And it is sometimes said that it's possibly the only building which has a monument to the men who destroyed it, rather than to the men who built it. Um, but it, an absolutely riveting account, and also a key thing, it examines and it challenges the accepted account. Now, I think we we'll take questions in, in the general session in the afternoon. So you'll have to wait till then, Liz, before people uh, question it. Now, our second speaker, Tom O'Neill, I think just 15 years ago, Tom, in around about 2006, I had the pleasure of speaking at the Dublin launch of Tom's book, The Battle of Clonmult, the first edition of it. And I said at the time that it was a model of historical research using all available resources, examining it from every side, from the IRA side, the British Army side, the RIC side, local history and so on like that. An absolute model of the way to approach the examination of an engagement. And I said at the time that I wished that people with Tom's qualifications would also examine other ones, such as Cross Barry, the Hedford ambush, other ones could do with that type of detailed analysis. And Tom has gone on to produce a second edition using the most up-to-date research. Now, apart from that, um, Tom has done marvelous, marvelous work in the restoration of Spike Island, making it a world-class tourist attraction and an absolutely fascinating place to, build, uh, to visit. And on top of that, he has produced a second book about Spike Island, 
And the key thing in it is absolutely full of the local research identifying each and every one of the Republican prisoners who were imprisoned or interned there during the War of Independence. But now, to come back to the Battle of Clonmult, I think it's great to have Tom here to give us, as Liz has done, an approach, a balanced approach that looks at the detail of the battle and how it transpired and the aftermath of it. Tom, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon everybody and Pat, thank you very much. Now the, the title of the presentation here this afternoon is The Battle of Clanmold, which I refer to as the IRA's worst defeat. Why do I refer to it as that? Because it had the highest loss of any flank column during the War of Independence. In effect, it was the only occasion during the War of Independence when the flank column was wiped out. And the Battle of Clanmold took place on Sunday, the 20th of February, 1921. Now, this is the, the cover of the book that Pat has just uh, mentioned, and it's available for sale here today and online. Now, the 4th Battalion flank column that was wiped out of Clanmold, the screen shows the area of operations of the, the 4th Battalion, and the yellow line running from left to right across the screen. That's an important reference point because that's the N25 from Cork City, which is on the center left of the map, right as far as y'all. And the two reference points I want to point out in that one then would be Carritool Village and Middleton. They will be mentioned a few times. And where is Clanmold? Well, if you follow the road from Middleton North, you'll actually see in blue Dungourney and Clanmult is just above that. Now, the opposing forces then in East Cork joined the War of Independence. On the Crown Forces side, you had the 2nd Battalion Hampshire Regiment based in Victoria Barracks, Cork. And it was a mobile patrol from the 2nd Hampshires that went to Clanmult initially. The 2nd Battalion of the Cameron Highlanders were responsible for the area around East Cork and they were based in Cove. And the reason they didn't go to Clanmult was because the information about the base camp, about where the IRA were, was taken to Victoria Barracks. And of course, there were very important RIC barracks reinforced by black and tans, dotted around the major towns in East Cork, and there were auxiliary police companies in Cork City. On the Irish volunteer side then, you had the, first, the area of the 4th Battalion. The 4th Battalion were part of the 1st Cork Brigade, and the two companies that provided most of the men for the flying column were A Company in Cove and B Company in Middleton. And in similar situations then throughout the country, these companies then, there were so many men on the run that they too formed the flying column in East Cork. And the company commander in Middleton and also the column commander at Clanmult was Commandant Dermot Hurley. During 1920 then, the local companies of the 4th Battalion had most of their successes, and I've just listed a few of the important ones. On early January 1921, they captured, they attacked, captured and destroyed Carrick Tool RIC barracks, and that was the first, first RIC barracks captured and destroyed in the, in the country during the War of Independence. A couple of weeks later, they had a successful raid in Castle Martyr RIC barracks. And on the 5th of June, they probably had their most successful ambush, 
when members of the local Middleton Company with Dermot Hurley disarmed a bicycle patrol of Cameron Highlanders guided by an RIC constable. And simply by pretending to be out on the road between Middleton and Carry Tool, pretending to be playing game of bowls, just as the bicycle patrol passed, two revolver shots were fired into the ditch to signal the beginning of the, the start of the attack, and they simply ran forward and pushed the soldiers off their bikes, captured all their equipment. But because of these attacks and these ambushes, the local RAC were still efficient, they were still operating, and they were picking up intelligence on who these, let's say, troublemakers were. And a couple of days after the, the Mile Bush ambush, Commandant Dermot Hurley's lodgings in Middleton were raided. He shared the lodgings with his second in command, Tig Manley. Hurley only barely escaped. Manley was captured and spent the rest of the war in prison. And because of those situations and because of lots of others, then quite a number of Men, men from Middleton and the Cove Company and indeed the others had to go on the run. And because so many were on the run, then the 4th Battalion Flying Column was formed in Nokraha, which is just northeast of the city, end of August, September 1920. And they spent from there until just before Christmas manoeuvring and operating in, the, in East Cork, but failing to make contact with any Crown Forces patrols. Then, on the night of the 11th, 12th of December, then, they did a dangerous, a, a careless manoeuvre. They decided that they would stay in a house in Klein, belonging to an IRA man on the run by the name of Bertie Walsh. And they had a very narrow escape because they were careless on the night, they never posted sentries. And the first they knew the following morning was that they were in trouble was when the British Army were banging on the front door. And it was only by guys and a, an, an aggressive breakout that they escaped. What they didn't realise was that two thirds of the British Army that were sent to investigate the house were in a truck that broke down. But you can see there were similarities, there, were carelessness, there was carelessness starting to creep in, no sentries. Then, just after Christmas, in what was the only action initiated by the column, the members of the column attacked a combined RIC black and tan foot patrol on the main street in Middleton, resulting in the death of an RIC constable Mullen and two black and tans. This was their first and last action as the flank column prior to the Battle of Clonmult. After Clonmult, after Christmas then, they moved to the battle site at Clonmult. They set up a base camp in a disused farmhouse. And remember, this was a flank column. However, they spent 45 days at their, at their base camp in Clanmult from the time they set up on the 6th of January until that fateful Sunday, the 20th of February. Does not conjure up an image of a flying column. One of the reasons given as to why they stayed there so long was that the site at Clanmult was used as a collecting point by the IRA for funds and taxes that were levied on local farmers to keep the, the war going. And even though they were keeping their head down in Clanmult, the attack on that foot patrol in Middleton was a major factor, and the Crown forces were determined to locate and neutralise the column. Now, the original house in the battle site of Clanmult is long gone. However, this is a model that was erected about 12 months ago for the centenary commemoration that unfortunately couldn't take place. 
but it's ideal now for me to explain the, the, the battle site. Now, there are two small buildings facing you. The one on the left, the one in between, so the one just on the corner, that now is a model of the battle site, of the house where they stayed. It's a single story, strictly speaking, with three, ro three rooms on the ground floor. It had two flaws, really. One was, and the Khan could do nothing about it, it had a thatched roof. The other was a major problem that, was, that they did nothing about. There was only one door into or out of the house, and you're looking at the front of the house. You're also looking at the, at the house and indeed the site from the direction that the British Army approached. So that one door and only door was a major problem. And at the rear of the house, there was just one small window. On the left-hand side, then, the almost two-story building, that's a cow shed that was at, uh, that, that is, as you can see, at right angles to the dwelling house. And the building on the right rear, then, is just another outhouse. The well that is part of the story, then, is just to the right of the grass, about 30 metres to the right of the photograph. I have another reason, then, to show you the, the model that would just show you how beautifully the battle site is now interpreted with information boards and the owner of the site is more welcoming. I'd highly recommend you pay it a visit, anybody interested. This then is the, the house just after the battle and you can see to the slightly right of centre is that critical only door. You can also see the bullet marks on the, uh, either side of windows and that, testament to the battle. Now, on the week prior to the battle, the, the flying column was tasked with a mission, and that was to attack a train carrying military stores at Cove Junction railway line. And that ambush was to take place on the Tuesday that we now know as after the battle, Tuesday the 22nd of February. And Cove Junction is the railway line where the Middleton Cove, the Middleton Cork City Railway joins the Cove Cork City Railway Line. And you can see there on the map, Cork City is on the centre left and come over there to just to the right of Cork City, you can see Little Island, and Cove Junction is just there. Now, that meant then that the column commander had two things to do in preparation for that ambush. One, he decided that the location where they had their base camp at Clanmult was too far to use as a jumping off point for the ambush. So he decided that he would move the column and just north of Carrick Tool. And it, again, if you followed the N25, that yellow line from Cork City to the right, you'll see the village of Carrick Tool. And just north of that, you'll see the village of Lemnora. That's where he decided to relocate the column to. So much closer to the ambush position. And the second thing he, the column commander had to do, as all commanders have to do when, they, when they're given a, a mission like that, to carry out a reconnaissance. Got to look at the ground and see where he can position the members of the column to give them the most advantage. So on the Saturday evening then, the evening before the battle, he had told the column that they were moving out to do battle, that they were moving out the following evening, the Sunday evening. So, carelessly again, five or six of the column decided to go to confession in the village of Dungorny, 
which is about two miles away from the battle site. And on their way back, they were spotted. Now, here is a drawing of the area in the vicinity of the battle site. And you can see two roads heading south for Dungorni. We'll pick the, the second one in from, from the right. And you can see it passes Rathorgan Crossroads. And then up to Carey's house, up by that forestry area at the top of the map, and go right, you can, you can see the battle site. So, what the column, what those five or six did then was, they went across by Carey's cottage, and they followed that road south into Dungorni. They should never have been given permission by the column commander to do that. That was endangering the column, because they were going outside their immediate area. They were dressed as flying column members. Then, obviously, they would have been armed. And they should never have been given permission because there was a church just beside the sea of Clanmull village. In fact, heading south east, the first building is a Catholic church. So I leave you, use your imagination as to why they went to Dungorni. And on their way back, they were spotted. They did take basic precautions. What they did was, they came back up that road again, past Rathorgan Crossroads. Rathorgan Crossroads is very important in the story. And they went north, just to the corner of the forestry, and they cut in by Carey's house, and then they approached the battle site from the forest. So they were taking basic precautions, but it was too little, too late. The informer had his eyes on them. He would have tracked them as far as that organ crossroads, and he spotted them turning into the right behind Carey's house. Amazingly, the informer concluded that the column were based in Carey's house and not in that, cup, the, in, in that area that's marked as the battle site. So, on the fateful Sunday morning then, the 20th of February, 1921, four young IRA Nafina volunteers cycled from near Ballycotton, way down to the, the southeast, to Clanmult with funds and cigarettes for the, the column. One of them had a second uh, reason for going there to visit his grandmother in Clanmull village. So they went to Clanmull village where one of them went in to visit his grandmother. At two o'clock then, the reconnaissance party, the column commander, etc., and that'll be all I'll tell you for now, left the battle site and headed to carry out his reconnaissance of the Cove Junction ambush position, not expecting to be coming back anymore. They were invited to the, public, to the local public house for refreshments, but unfortunately in this instance they declined. So they left the area by car. One member of the column, then Dick Hagerty, he was away on leave for the weekend. He returned and he was dropped off from a horse and trap in Clanmull village, saw the three young lads waiting for the other man, and when the five of them got together, they went up to the battle site where they, well, to the, 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 the um, column's base camp, where they arrived at about half past two. The reconnaissance party, most important, and unfortunately, couldn't be, couldn't be more wrong. The normal procedure in military is that the commander, be it a section commander, battalion commander, it doesn't matter, the section commander, or in this case the column commander, carry out, carries out the reconnaissance. The job is to survey the area, make his plans for the battle or the ambush, then issue the plans to the, in this case, the column. So he was leaving. And always you hand over to your second in command. That's what your second in command is for, to take over while you're away. 
Unfortunately, in this instance, the column commander, Dermot Hurley, took his second in command with him, Joseph Ahern. He took his third in command, Captain Paddy Whelan, with him. So now he was after stripping the column of the three senior officers. He never took a security party of a couple of, of members of the column. And before leaving, he handed over to Captain Jack O'Connell, who was not the next senior officer. And then they departed, and the instructions to Jack O'Connell was to vacate the farmhouse after last light that evening. There's the reconnaissance party, and there's the column commander in the middle. Now, this then, dropping all the way down and to Jack O'Connell, caused the command conflict because it meant they were after bypassing another officer who was senior to Jack O'Connell, Captain Paddy Higgins. But the second in command of the column, Ahern, was not impressed with Higgins' performance the night of the ambush of the foot patrol in Middleton. So that's why he was bypassed in favour of Jack O'Connell. So now it was a, a reduced efficient column because all the senior officers were gone off. But now there was a command conflict as well, just as they were about to face their baptism of fire. And there's Jack O'Connell on the left and Paddy Higgins on the right. The problem was trouble with a capital T was on its way because the informer had concluded that the column were based in Carey's house, reported to Victoria Barracks in Cork, now Collins Barracks. And that's why troops from Victoria Barracks reacted and moved to Clanmult and not the local Cameron Highlanders. And a patrol, a mobile patrol of the 2nd Hampshire's under Lieutenant D.F. Hook was detailed to go down and investigate the sighting. Excuse me. And they departed Victoria Bags around quarter past two. And the route they took to Rat Organ Crossroads, again just south of the forestry, was the most ideal covert route. Quite a few people in Middleton would not be able to find the network of by roads to take you there. So instead of going from Middleton to Dungourney, which is the normal route to go to Clanmult, they took the road to Fermoy up to East Cork, East Cork Isle, turned half right past East Cork Golf Club, staying up past the satellite station, turned right at the Y, turned right at the Spencer Crossroads, and ended up at Rathorgan Crossroads. The perfect route the most covert route, and they set up the British Army's patrol harbour at Rathorgan Crossroads. Because remember, up to now, up to this instant, they still thought, which was their objective, their objective was to carry out a cordon and search on Carey's house, believing that's where the column was located. So they parked their uh, vehicles there and set up their patrol harbour. Just so in the 30 minutes before the battle commenced then, this is the balance of the, of the opposing forces. There were a total of 27 all ranks from the Hampshires, of which nine of them, the two drivers and seven soldiers from the Hampshires remained at the crossroads. Vital mission to protect and to guard the patrol harbour and to act as a fire base if the advancing troops came under overwhelming odds. And Hook then broke the remainder of his patrol down into two fighting patrols, two foot patrols, two officers and eight, that's Hook took that patrol, Hook and Dove, the two officers, took eight soldiers, and Coe and Hammond took the sec sorry, Coe and Hammond and eight took the first patrol, and Hook, Dove and six took the second patrol. And in the house then, at this stage, there were 20 um, members of the, 
they, they, there should have been 20 members of the column, because, but three, have the, three had departed on reconnaissance, which left 17 active via Raymond and the four young cyclists. So that meant, at this stage, there were 18 soldiers heading their way, and there were 21 in the house. This was a massive numerical advantage for the IRA, because troops crossing open ground, engaging, in this case the IRA, in a defensive position in the house, need a ratio of three times more than those in defended positions. So you can see massive advantage at this stage to the IRA. So Patrol A, Cohen Hammond with CS Corney, that, brought, that patrol was 10, and the others then was eight, and they were about to do a cordon search on the wrong house. So, down, you can see the red circle, number two, that's Rathorgan Crossroads, and the two foot patrols came up by number three and did a cordon and search on, we now know, the wrong house, Carey's Cottage. What they found was not a column, they found an old, an old lady um, saying her Sunday afternoon rosary. That should have been the end of that day, because now the British Army Mobile Patrol, and specifically Lieutenant Tuck, had carried out his orders. Go down there, investigate. F uh, they found nothing, so he could well have said, that's it, they're not here, let's get back to barracks. No. He decided, well, he, what he would have actually done is opened his map and done a map reconnaissance, and he spotted this other house about 500 metres away and said, look, we're here, we're early, we better just continue and do another cordon search. So he decided then that he, in his patrol, the number six, the left-hand one, would do a left flanking up through the forestry and cause patrol then with the right flanking and head for the objective. Uppermost in their mind would have been the danger of, of sentries, both for the first objective and now the new objective. However, the flying column were now going to pay the ultimate price for the basic rules of warfare that were fatally missed. One, they spent six, six weeks in the one location. They did not improve the defensiveness or in this case, the escape of, of, from the house. At the very minimum, they should have blown a rat hole out the back of the wall. Remember, it was a disused farmhouse with only one door. It was a trap. It, 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 it was a dead trap. There was nothing they could do about the detached roof. The composition of the reconnaissance party, as I've explained, massively weakened the column. There was the command conflict between the two senior officers. There was one more, and it sealed their fate. Two sentries had been left out, had been ordered out, as sentries are absolutely vital in warfare, because you have to have early warning and the sentries. I would say that if there was one regular issue, fault even, with IRA activities throughout the country during the War of Independence, it was they did not understand the importance of sentries or they did not understand what is involved in managing sentries. Sometimes they did post sentries and then just forgot about them. In this instance, the two sentries had decided themselves there's nobody going to attack us on a Sunday afternoon and they were inside in the house packing their belongings for the march out. The acting column commander, Jack O'Connell, spotted them, did nothing about them. He should have drawn his pistol and ordered them out. And very simply, get out one hour and I'll have somebody relieve you. But no, it was ignored. 
You have to take it into consideration. Sentries, no matter where they are, they do not want to be there. So they have to be managed and supervised. Because trouble was on its way and Lieutenant Coe's patrol was first. Here's Cohen from the South West, number, uh, letter A. And he approached the, fa the farmhouse from the South West knew he was in bother when he saw all the push bikes outside because remember there were only 10 and he maneuvered along that red line then in front of the the farmhouse the view he, and the view he had and his men had was the view i showed you a while ago of the model and he was maneuvering around to see and just as he was passing the front end, one of the volunteers just happened to be looking out the window and spotted the, the soldiers passing. And the reaction was the wrong one. The alarm was raised, they were all called into the house and the door was slammed. The real uh, option and that was an aggressive breakout. And just as the patrol maneuvered around to see two volunteers had been detailed to go down and fill the water bottles to the, um, at the well, the well of sea, and they were surprised by Coe's men, bit of a gun battle, and both of them were killed, both of them mortally wounded. And John Joe Joyce and Michael Desmond were down there, so they were the first fatalities. And John Joe Joyce made it to the rear window of the building where he told those inside that they were surrounded. Now, in effect, they weren't, but they were as good as because the soldiers had that front door covered. There was still no way out. John Joe Joyce, Michael Desmond, the first two fatalities of the column. Jack O'Connell then concluded correctly that the only alternative here now was a breakout. But the command conflict came in. This was a time for issuing of orders, yes sir, and let's go. But Jack O'Connell said we would, Higgins said no, I'm staying. So it transpired only uh, four others uh, went, 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 went with him. Now Jack O'Connell was one of the four. And the next man out, the second man out, was Michael Halhan on the left. He was shot dead at the door. Dick Hagerty, the man that had just literally returned to the column half an hour earlier with the four young lads, he managed to get three or four metres in front of the door where he was mortally wounded. And James Ahern managed to break through the cordon, ran off, uh, that's uh, F, that, that uh, blue line running down, that's the route taken by James Ahern. Unfortunately, he ran in the direction of Rathorgan Crossroads, where one of the British Army sentries up there shot him dead. And D then, the, um, the blue line heading off high right, that was the route taken by Jack O'Connell. So luckily, he went in the right direction because very soon after Coe's troops started opening fire, Hook now knew that, well, look, the element of surprise is gone now, so he doubled his patrol down, patrol B coming in from the, the north, and that then completed the, the entire 360-degree uh, cordon on the, the, the site. So, situation as of now then, the breakout was their only option, it was very badly organised because it had never previously rehearsed. And at this stage, we now have five IRA men dead, one escaped, and there are still 11 IRA men and the four young lads still trapped. The stalemate then, Cap Captain Paddy Higgins was now in charge because Jacko was gone, and he decided that he was going to wait for members of the local company to come to their assistance, which never happened. Neither the IRA nor the British Army had the upper hand. The IRA couldn't get out and 
British Army didn't have the, the manpower, the, the soldiers, to actually overwhelm the defenders. So Hook decided that he would send two soldiers back to Rathorgan Crossroads to the transport with orders to head for Middleton to look for reinforcements and bring petrol and grenades with you. And they did that, and unfortunately for the column, when the soldiers arrived at the RIC barracks in Middleton, a mobile patrol of aux auxiliary police from Cork City just happened to be calling, because that time before all these bypasses, the main road from Cork to Waterford passed within about 30 metres of the RIC barracks. So the reinforcements were coming for the British forces, British Army, not for the IRA. At about half past five then, one of the British Army officers, Lieutenant Hammond, took possession of some grenades and the petrol that the soldiers had brought with them, went around the rear of the house and stood up in a ditch and threw the petrol up on the thatch. And two grenades followed then. When they exploded, they set fire to the thatch. So at this stage now, with the smell of of burning thatch in their nostrils and overpowering them, the IRA men in the house had a choice really of, well, the, the, the three choices, charge out, which wasn't really a, a choice, surrender or burn to death. And they were told if they come out that they can surrender. And some of them decided, some of the IRA men decided that they were not going to just hand over their weapons so, a bit carelessly, they threw their loaded weapons into a blazing fire, which is not something you do with live ammunition, because after it heats up, it just cooks off, it just explodes in the fire. So, out they came then. The first 12 men came out then, and you'll remember from the model, in front of the house on the left, there's the cow shed. So, the auxiliaries were in front, waiting to come out with their hands up, and they directed them over in front of the cowshed, where almost immediately the auxiliary police opened up on them with their revolvers. And in seconds, seven of the, of the surrendering column were shot dead. The eighth man, Paddy Higgins, the man that, that was now acting con commander, he had a revolver pointed to his upper lip and the auxiliary pulled the trigger. I've never seen it, and I don't think anybody ever saw it. The round just barely detonated, punctured his upper lip, and lodged in his front, in his top teeth. He went down, of course, there was still a bang, and there was shock. He thought he was dead. Down he went. A British Army officer then quickly stepped in when he realised that the auxiliaries were not taking prisoners and stopped the killing. So that British Army officer saved the remaining. So that meant there were five of the 12 that came out still alive. Some of them were slightly wounded. And the last three men were delayed in exiting the house because one of the IRA men, Sonny O'Leary, had decided he was going to try and blow a hole in the, the back wall of the house with, with bayonet and that and all that. But when he stuck his head out, it was, it was covered by a British Army sentry and the sentry fired at him, but just it grazed across the top of his head. But he was coming out of unconsciousness, so two of the IRA men decided to stay with him. So that delay saved their lives. What the... Crown forces claimed that there was a false surrender, that when the soldier, when the IRA men started advancing out from the house, they heard shots, and some of the IRA men then scattered and ran, and that's why they killed them. Was it a false claim, or was it the ammunition exploding in the open fire? Or was it in reality the auxiliary police revenge for the loss of their comrades in the ambush 
in West Cork in November at Kilmichael and in revenge for the loss of their three colleagues in the Middleton ambush. The casualty list then for Clanmult where there were 12 IRA men killed and eight volunteers captured and of course we know of the 21 then just that one Jack O'Connell escaped. There were no fatalities uh, for the Crown Forces and the senior NCO, CSM Corney of the Hampshires, was wounded by Jack O'Connell when Jack O'Connell was breaking out and there was one other RIC constable wounded. So now that is the story of the death. This is the, the very famous composite photograph of the 14 men that lost their lives as a result of Clan Mult. And 12 of those, you now know how they died, but the man on the back right and the front right, the, the smaller photograph, he, he's, he, he's sort of uh, on, on the right front, uh, those two were captured at Clan Mult. This then was why East Cork was very quiet after Clan Mult because, and I've intentionally put in IRA weapons recovered by Crown Forces at Clanmold. Why recovered? Because these were the weapons that the IRA succeeded in getting from Crown Forces in those engagements in East Cork before that. So these were all police or military weapons because 13 service rifles and carbines the carbines are the smaller 303 rifles. That's why they're called carbines, because they're smaller, used by the police. So they would all have been captured. Two shotguns, 12 revolvers, at 198 rounds of service ammunition, six bayonets, grenade, and all almost difficult to replace. After Clanmult, it would have been possible to replace the men lost. The weapons was a totally different uh, scenario. Now, why have I grenade with all the stars in it? Because there were two occasions that grenades would have been critical. And certainly that grenade or grenades that were recovered after Clan Mult when the Crown Forces searched the body, searched the building, that should have been used immediately before the breakout. Just throw that grenade out, leave it go, it could well have caused casualties amongst the Crown Forces. The dust, the noise, it would have been a major distraction. It would have been a little bit of fire support for the fellows breaking out. I think it was the way they had the grenade. It takes a little bit of effort, a bit of training, a bit of practice to know what a grenade do, and you must fire the grenade. There's no point in looking at the grenade until you fire the real thing and knowing Oh, there's a six second fuse. Oh, it, there's a fair bang and the shrapnel. But I'd say they had them, but they didn't know what to do with them. After the battle then, the Crown Forces collected the prisoners and now the Crown Force priority was to get out of there because they were there so long, it was getting dark. They took them to Middleton RSE barracks to uh, try and identify some of them and from there to the Victoria barracks. Jack O'Connell in his escape from from the battle site, he met two local volunteers, Foley and Lawton, and he was hoping they might bring weapons or bring reinforcement, but uh, he waited for a while, it didn't happen. Now, the reconnaissance party, the reconnaissance party were to meet up with Commandant Mick Burke, who was the company commander in Cove, and because the Cove company were to reinforce the column for that ambush at, at Cove Junction. And on his way to meet the recce party, he met a volunteer who told him that something dreadful had happened at Clan Mult, but he didn't know any details. So the reconnaissance party decided that if anybody had escaped, they'd go to Nokraha. So they went to Nokraha, where they met Jack O'Connell, and he was with Martin Corrie. And about, it must have been somewhere around 11 or 12 o'clock that night then, the tree officers of the reconnaissance party and Jack O'Connell returned to the battle site. At that stage, all they saw was the, the, the thatch on fire and the bodies had been laid out under tarpaulin by some of the locals after the bridge had departed. 
and the, there was a military court of inquiry then in, in lieu of an inquest in Victoria Barracks on the bodies. The bodies were left at the battle site until the Monday morning and they were recovered then to Victoria Barracks. The 12 remains then of the dead men were handed over to their families on Wednesday night and they were buried. Two of them are buried in the Cove Republican plot, nine in Middleton and Dick Hagerty in Ballamacoda. The eight prisoners then, seven of them, the eighth man, Higgins, shot in the mouth. He was declared unfit to be tried because of his injuries. Uh, seven of them were charged with levying war against the king and all found guilty. The three adults, O'Leary, O'Sullivan and Moore, the two others in that composite photograph, were sentenced to death and the four young lads were sentenced to penal servitude for life. And they were appealed and the appeals were lost. O'Leary's death sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life. It's hard to believe it, but it was the GOC 6 Brigade, General Strickland, who was the, the military governor, because he actually recommended to Dublin that O'Leary uh, be commuted because two of O'Leary's brothers had lost their lives serving in the Royal Navy in the First War. And then on Thursday the 28th of April, the two for Clanmull, Patrick O'Sullivan and Morris Moore, and two other colleagues captured at Moore Abbey, Thomas Mulcahy and Patrick Ronan, were executed in the exercise yard of the military detention barracks, which is just at the rear of of Victoria Barracks or Collins Barracks. It was Cork Prison for years after that. And they're all buried then with their other colleagues that were executed in, in 1921 in Cork Male Jail, which is now part of the UCC campus. And there's Patrick O'Sullivan and Morris Moore executed on the 28th of April. For some reason, there are a lot of accounts of those two being executed on the 5th of May, wherever that crept in, but in effect it was Thursday, the 28th of April. And then the following day, or two days later, the five others that had been tried, O'Leary, because his death sentence was commuted, Harty, Gard, Terry and Walsh, the four young lads that cycled out, they were transferred to the British military prison on Spike Island. All hell broke loose in East Cork after that then. The IRA could not afford to carry out reprisals while there were so many of their men in prison because they wanted to give them every opportunity uh, uh, for the Crown Forces or the British authorities to uh, commute their sentence. But after the execution, the gloves were off. The following day, a British Army officer that had been held hostage uh, Compton Smith, he was executed by the IRA in North Cork. The following day, Michael O'Keefe, a retired soldier, and that's just a few of them, two black and tans in Castle Martha Wood. In what I refer to generally, there was a, a bloody month of November, uh, which Pat, uh, and certainly was, uh, that Pat mentioned earlier, but this was the bloody month of May in East Cork. During that month, 17 uh, the, the IRA killed 17 and Crown Forces killed six in a small area. David Walsh, you might say, why have I bypassed him? I want to come back to him. He was a former soldier and he is the man then specifically targeted as the informer for Clanmult. He was captured by the IRA in Glenville, North Cork. He was given a choice. Either admit to being the informer or we'll shoot you. And if you do admit to being the informer, your sentence will be that you're out of the country. So with that type of a choice, he said, yeah, okay, in that case, I did it. And they tried him and shot him. The British military are adamant he was not an informer, not a mind the informer. So it was never really ascertained um, who the informer was. The column commander then, he ran out of luck. His, his, his most uh, successful ambush was the one I mentioned when he and his men took 
a British Army mo um, bicycle patrol by surprise at that one just outside Middleton. Well, his luck ran out on the 28th of May, just north of Middleton, when he was surprised by an RIC bicycle patrol. And again, when they shot him, they didn't realise, they didn't know for a day or two who they had shot. But when they searched his body, he had a um, semi-automatic pistol and a grenade. And again, that was another occasion when a grenade mightn't have saved him, but it would have certainly uh, forced the Crown forces to keep their heads down if he had thrown that grenade at that bicycle patrol. When Dermot Hurley was killed that day, in a frightful um, percentage, it brought to 75% the number of the column that were present at Clanmold that day meant there was 75% of them dead now. Now, normally, an army would sort of consider like a half of 1%, or 1% is, that's enough in modern terms. But 75% is an amazing uh, amount of, of fatalities now, not casualties, fatalities. Paddy Higgins, then the last man, the man shot in the mouth, he was eventually tried in June, almost immediately found guilty and sentenced to death, but his appeal extended beyond the truce, and the truce saved him, and eventually he was actually released. He was the first of them to be released. The truce then, the treaty, and the civil war, and this then is a photograph, I'm sure it's, it's considered um, an iconic photograph of the volunteers uh, taken during the War of Independence. It's used throughout for several places. What people may not be aware of, most of those are members of the, the, the column that were wiped out at Clanmult. With the exception of the two men on the right, White and Stanton, the remainder were at Clanmult. All of those then, this is the, 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 what's generally referred to as the Black and Tan Service Medal, or more correctly, the 1721 Service Medal that was given to all of those at Clanmult. And there are the two books then that, that uh, Pat mentioned earlier, available. And that's the end of the presentation. Many thanks. I think you'll agree the level of detail, the level of analysis. And it's so important that we remember and that we learn from the defeats as much as the victories. We all grew up, certainly I grew up, reading and hearing about Kilmichael, Crossbarry and other victories. Clonmult was never mentioned. But yet it is hugely, hugely important on that. And Again, Tom, thanks very much for that absolutely fantastic presentation and the mistakes that were made. You know, so be it. Now, we now have, as they would say in the, the GA, a water break, or more precisely, tea and coffee and sandwiches. And we start back again at half one, say, Tom. Yeah, that's fast, Rosemary. Rosemary. Half one. So there's tea and coffee and sandwiches available and we look forward to the afternoon. So again, thank you very much and as I say, it's fantastic to have a live audience. It makes all the difference. Thank you very much. So, and thanks to Liz and to Tom for this morning. And Tomas and Tom, you have a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Right. Um, good afternoon. We start again. And we start with Tomás McConamara. Tomás, a native of Clare, of Rouen to be precise, has specialised in perhaps one of the most challenging aspects of history, and that is memory and the uh, social memory of the War of Independence. Now, oral history and memory are, I believe, the most challenging part of history, because memories differ. You and I might have different memories of the same set of events. And as an aside, me being from Waterford, Tomás from Clare, if we sat down to discuss a certain hurling match that happened in July 1998, he would have a very different social memory of that event than I would, the way he attacked us. <laughs> but um, we're not here to talk about that, but, but Tomás has published quite a number of books on the War of Independence in Clare, including Paddy Brennan's book, an Irish rebel autograph book from From Gough, the Clare Volunteers and the Mount Chai Hunger Strike of 1917, and a very interesting one, The Time of the Tans, an oral history of the War of Independence, which is based on the folk memories and makes it all the more um, interesting. And his latest work deals with an appalling event in Clare, the Scarf Martyrs, um, in November 1920. So, Tomás, over to you. Gormila Mahagot Pat, Gormahagiv Elig, Agustin Krishter Fad, Asachtan Kurev, and Saharisht. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, it's my third time being at the Nak Lang History Seminar, and I love being here because of the, the very real and sincere connection that that all of you have here to local history and the understanding that you have and that you, you display that the local is the national and the national is the local. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. I'm also delighted to be here in the company of all these historians who I respect hugely. Um, I've known Pat McCarthy for a while, Tom O'Neill I've just met for the first time today, but I've respected both of them for many years. And as a testimony to the respect I have for, for Tom Toomey and Liz Gillis, Tom Toomey launched my book, the Days of Hunger and the Mount Jai Hunger Strike of 1917 and Liz Gillis launched my last book on the Scarf Martyrs just last week and you know to, to get somebody to come and to, to be the person that launches your book that you've spent a lot of years on you know is something very well considered and there's not two historians in the country I respect more uh, certainly than Tom Toomey and, and Liz Gillis so as I say I'm delighted to be in their company. I was in uh, Turles uh, in 1998, Pat, to watch that very successful ambush that we launched on the, the Dacia Min, and I suppose we could maybe, the IRA could learn maybe from the approach of Colin Lynch and people like that and the way we executed that particular ambush, but maybe we need to learn a bit more uh, now. But look, uh, as I say, I'm here to talk about the Scarif Martyrs. It, it fits in very well in terms of the, you know, the impact of an incident uh, and, you know, particularly Tlan Mult in some ways, while it wouldn't match up with the numbers, there are certain uh, connections with regard to, I suppose, lapses in discipline, etc., which, which I'll, I'll talk through. But certainly one thing I want to talk about is the effect of these incidents and the effect of these incidents, uh, particularly at a local level and particularly the way they manifest in memory, because you know, as a historian, you obviously have to use all of the evidence available to you to try and, you know, understand what happened in any particular incident, what was the, the background, the political context, the military context, etc. But I also feel very strongly that it's, it's, it's also important to understand the emotional impact um, and even the cultural impact of an incident on a particular area. And obviously with the Scarif Martyrs, that's something I've explored uh, fairly deeply over, over a good number of years. Just to make the point, I suppose, first of all, that certainly in County Clare, the Scarif Martyrs story and incident is the most commemorated incident um, and the most remembered incident in some ways, if we are to, to measure that by 
commemorations, songs, and the installation of monuments over the years. The monument on the bridge of Killaloo, where the four men uh, were murdered, is the second oldest, by my estimation, in the country, only behind Maru. And uh, that is November 1923, which is particularly early, obviously, for the installation of a Republican monument. But ever since then, it has played an important role for those who were aware of it in terms of preserving the memory of the incident in some fashion. It was the site of commemoration, particularly um, by this man, Mike Daly, who, who was responsible for the commemoration or the monument in 1923, and who for many decades afterwards. Uh, laid a wreath there uh, every November and it, it was the site last year of a centenary commemoration on the bridge at midnight. Up in Scarif, where the four men are buried, the, their grave has, begun, has become the site of commemoration regularly over the last 100 years. Almost every year over the last century there has been a commemoration of some kind uh, to the Scarif Martyrs by loosely the same grouping the, which is now referred to as the East Clare Memorial Committee. The monument you see on the left hand side was erected in 1945 after a big campaign to create a suitable memorial for the four men but prior to that as you can see from the top right hand photograph there were four white crosses which uh, you know, indicate obviously the site was marked, but you know, fortunately, as you can see, the photograph was not in great condition when I got it. But it actually gave me the order in which the four men were buried, which again, you know, may not be on the face of it historically significant, but I think adds to our sense of knowing uh, about the incident and the aftermath because the funeral itself was a hugely. Um, naturally an emotive occasion, but because the British forces came there, as I, as I will explain, when they were buried, the moment of their burial became seared into the consciousness of the local uh, community uh, over the years as well. Last year there were active commemorations in many, many different ways. We had to obviously innovate because of the pandemic, but one of the things that we're, we're proud of was that uh, when Coincidentally, Killaloo and Scarif, the two areas most connected to the story, met in the intermediate uh, Hurland semi-final. We approached both clubs and asked them to consider wearing black armbands, which they both uh, were, were only too happy to, to do so. Uh, the man on the right-hand side is Mark Rogers, who's now a clear hurler, but is also the, grand, the great-grand-nephew of Alfie Rogers, and he was very proud to wear that. Um, ironically, the we, it, it was close to being stopped by our county board, which is a, a particularly strange intervention, but thankfully we were able to overcome that particular opposition and it went ahead to the great um, um, satisfaction of many people. The songs associated with the incident have played a particularly important role. There's a, a fairly well-known song by, um, that was written, I should say, quite early, in actual fact six weeks after the incident, um, had been circulating in the locality since that time and has been sung by many, many different performers. Christy Moore sung the song in the 1970s after hearing it in Tulla as a 19-year-old in the 1960s. And he, I suppose, to some extent popularised it more broadly, but certainly in East Clare, you know, at house dances, at, at, at various occasions, the song would be sung. And for those of you who have heard it, it has a... It has a very powerful lament at the heart of it, but it also is a narrative type of a ballad which tells the story of the Scarif Martyrs in terms of their um, time on the run, their betrayal by an informer, their capture in Williamstown and their eventual um, deaths on the bridge of Killaloo as well as their funeral. So it, it, it helped to reinforce the basics of the story uh, within the community across the last century. So you get to a point where, you know, a hundred years later, or I suppose it was earlier than that, when I began my research properly back in about 2004, that the story was well known at certain levels anyway within the community. And certainly if, you know, you mentioned the War of Independence in East Clare, 
one of the first things you will hear about would be the scar of martyrs because it was of course you know militarily um, from the point of view of numbers the most significant incident you know you had three active IRA volunteers killed in one incident which was uh, the, the most in County Clare across the War of Independence and of course the fort um, civilian Michael Egan um, who I'll talk about in a little while but two particularly important people for me in my research were uh, Margaret Hoey on the left hand side and Paddy Gleeson on the right hand side. I first interviewed Paddy back in 2004 um, about the Scarif Martyrs and Paddy who was from a place called O'Callaghan's Mills had been living in Tumgraney, my own native village and I actually should clarify that Rowan is, um, I, I, I'm not sure how I got attached to Rowan, Tom Toomey thinks it's because I was being confused with Jimmy Smith but uh, I, I'd love to think that but I'm from a place called Tumgraney in East Clare and Paddy lived there when he was a teenager and experienced the War of Independence during that time and was able to give me fantastic recall when I visited him first when he was uh, 100 years of age. He died six years later at the age of 106, Ireland, Ireland's oldest man. And by that stage, I had interviewed him many, many times and he had given me not only you know, historical detail, but also a sense of the experience of that time and what it was like to live through that, what the effect of you know, fairly constant raids during that time uh, were like, you know, keep in mind that he was 14, 15 years of age at the time. The lady on the left, Margaret Hoey, um, was the same age as Paddy, born in 1904, and whenever I spoke to her in 2008, she, w being from Scarif, was able to recall Alfie Rogers, Brod McMahon and Martin Gilday, the three men who had been living in Scarif, with, with incredible detail and uh, clarity. And she also was able to remember the morning, or the day after, the murders in Killaloo when an IRA volunteer called to her door and told her mother that the men had been killed. And I'll never forget, I've used it as the prologue for the book, I'll never forget the emotion, you know, when she was at the age of 105 crying tears in front of me about hearing that story, hearing that news, because she knew three of them and how she was dispatched up a roadway to tell other IRA volunteers and how at the time as a 16 year old she was crying and crying in front of me as a 105 year old um, nine decades after it really brought home to me the level of emotion surrounding the incident and in some ways I suppose it's different in a way to, to Clan Mult in the sense that um, you know these men were from the locality so I suppose it, it had an impact uh, within that area uh, you know that had maybe more endurance in terms of memory and in terms of the emotional impact. Over time I suppose I began to separate out that impact into to two different um, effects, one for the family and one for the community, because you know we have to realise that although before long the community had transformed it into a, a rallying call, into a, a pride um, in the scar of martyrs, even the term, the use of the term martyrs, of course, brings its own connotations. But for the family, there was complete wreckage and complete pain and suffering um, that lasted for generations. And particularly with, for the parents of those young men, um, we can't, I suppose, begin to comprehend the level of, of pain that that caused. Um, so I had to try and hopefully understand that over time. I want to briefly introduce the four men and just to give a little bit of context before we go into uh, at least part of their story. But uh, the man on the left is Martin Gilday. Now Martin was not from Scarif, he wasn't from County Clare, he was from a place called Woodlawn up in Nguyen in Galway. And Martin had, you know, again an interesting background in that his parents had ran off to America to get married in defiance of the local landlord and of the father of, um, or the mother of Martin Gilday, Nora. They came back some years later, back to Galway because of his mother's ill health, uh, where after Martin was born. When he was eight, his mother died uh, shortly after giving birth to Martin's sister, Honoria. And uh, Martin later worked in uh, Loch Ray and subsequently went to Kilcullen. But when he came back to Scarif in East Clare in 1916, he started working for uh, um, a merchant called Denham Sparling and became very well known in the local community, was a great Irish dancer and taught people 
Irish dancing within the community, which again endeared him to many within the community. Um, from what I've been able to establish from people, very, very well liked, very nice individual, was 30 years of age when the incident happened, which would have been, I suppose, you know, the, the, the more senior uh, age on average for an IRA volunteer. Alfie Rogers next to him was 23 when he was killed. Alfie was from a local um, business family who are still very much uh, go going strong in Scarif. Has been described to me as happy-go-lucky type of a fella. I'd say a bit of a rogue um, from the, the different stories I'm able to encounter about him. Had spent time in Mungret where he was uh, educated. Very well known, very well liked within the community. Ironically, and thanks to my great friend Tom Toomey, um, who, who observed that Christopher Lucy and Tim Madigan were both classmates of Alfie and Mungret, and both died within a month of Alfie uh, in November and December 1920. But certainly within Scarif, he was well known, and I'll come back to his, I suppose, um, the, the, the Alfie Rogers of October 1920 in a little while. Michael Brod McMahon then, 27 when he was killed, uh, Brod McMahon, like Alfie and Martin, hugely committed to the Irish language. In Tumgraney in East Clare, there had been a huge revival of the Irish language in the years prior to the War of Independence, led principally by, by Edward MacLyset, who developed a new Gaeltacht within the community, had invited people from the Ring Gaeltachts in, in, in Waterford and Carrigaholt, uh, to come and live in Tumgraney, to be part of that revival. Padraig O'Kaila, who was one of the founders of the Ring Irish College, came and lived in, in the community and became a big part of that revival. But Broad McMahon, Alfie Rogers, uh, principally, but also Martin Gilday, were involved in the promotion of the Irish language. It was something hugely important to them as young men uh, bound up in the revolutionary uh, atmosphere of their time. And the fourth individual who we um, will introduce is Michael Egan. Now, Michael was not a member of the IRA. Uh, Michael got pulled into the story in the final day, really, or the final days of the entire episode when he, as caretaker of Williamstown House, allowed the other three men to shelter there while they were on the run. Uh, for reasons of which I'll explain in a little while. But as a result of that, and as a result of his attempts when the auxiliaries came to capture them, to divert them, he was taken into the SS Shannon, the boat in which they were all uh, taken back to Killaloo, and he was tortured and killed as well, as I'll explain. Just to get a geographical sense then, what we're looking at here is Loch Derg, and the principal areas that are involved in this story are Whitegate, um, you know, furthest north, uh, where they had been staying for a period of time in Williamstown House, Scarif, where the men were living, where you know, two of them were from and where Martin Gilday had been living for a number of years and where Michael Egan had spent a lot of time as a part-time postman. And then, of course, down in Killaloo, where at the Lakeside Hotel, G Company of the Auxiliaries, who captured them, were based and where on the bridge on the 16th of November 1920, at approximately midnight, they were uh, shot dead. So that's the landscape we're, we're, we're dealing with um, in terms of the, the principal areas involved. So 59 days, um, 59 days relate to the period between the 18th of September 1920 and the 16th of November when they were captured. Now those 59 days are hugely significant, starting with the um, in intensified attacks on the RIC. I don't obviously need to go through a, a breakdown of the, the War of Independence. So effectively, I'm going to jump into September 1920, when certainly in East Clare, the war had intensified. Of course, there had been significant activity prior to that. There is tr significant, or there is substantial evidence to show McMahon, Rogers and Gilday, who were part of the, the 4th Battalion, the Scarif Company and the 4th Battalion, Italian to the East Clare IRA had been very active IRA volunteers. They had gone up, for example, to Galway in 1919 to secure five service rifles for the East Clare IRA, which would be a significant haul of weapons um, and would be a significant uh, action in, in itself to, to, to be sent to collect those weapons and bring them back to um, their comrades in the East Clare IRA. But like elsewhere, across that period, leading up to that period, RIC barracks and RIC outposts had been attacked and by September only Scarif 
in North East Clare remained as a substantial barracks. It had been reinforced by uh, the RIC with the support of a man called John Joe Fitzgerald, who was sent down as one of uh, about 30 barracks officers that were sent throughout the country to help reinforce barracks that had been uh, under threat of attack by the IRA. It's a poor photograph. Um, uh, I don't know if it's going to come up on the screen there for the people who are here, but uh, we'll, we'll wait for that. I think the, hopefully the people online are still seeing it, but the, the barracks in Scarif uh, in the middle of September remained, as I said, the, the stronghold of East Clare. So the IRA decided to attack that. Now, what is significant about that incident and that moment is that up until that time, the evidence shows that Broad McMahon, Alfie Rogers and Martin Gilday had remained uh, uh, outside of the gaze of the RIC in terms of their IRA activism, which was a remarkable achievement, you know, considering their prominence within the local community, considering their prominence within the IRA, which is evident. But it turns out that only when the attack happened on the 18th of September was their mask slipped and did the IRA realise their involvement. In fact, I found in a tape recording from 1989 that the night before the attack, Alfie Rogers had managed to get into the barracks on the pretext that he was friendly with the RAC to get some vital information for the IRA about their defences, uh, which then were, were, were used the following night when he, uh, Broad McMahon and Martin Gilday were, were critical in um, directing the fire. The IRA had come from right across the East Air Brigade from over New Market on Fergus, had a, a significant contingent, contingent which included Peter Higgins, the uncle of the current Uchtaran Nihern, um, was involved in the attack. It had men from this area, Bill Hayes, Nicholas O'Dwyer, and even Tomas Omwelon, uh, Westmead's Tomas Omwelon, who obviously spent time in this area as well. They had come over to support, particularly Michal Brennan, um, who had been in this area uh, earlier on in the War of Independence and I think they, they owed him a favour, I suppose, to some degree. But the attack involved a huge amount of planning and uh, had, had involved the transportation of hand grenades from Dublin down to East Clare through a network of IRA activists. And that would be hugely significant, as I'll explain shortly. But it was well organised, intelligence was good, uh, principally led by Rogers, McMahon and Gilday. The people of the community had been informed prior to it to quietly make their way out of the town and approximately uh, nine o'clock the attack began and was, as I said, well arranged, well planned, relatively well executed. Two of the RIC were wounded, Sergeant O'Sullivan, the, the uh, Sergeant O'Sullivan I should say, and, and uh, Constable Edward Broderick, a black and tan, were both shot and wounded but did not die. The RIC defended the barracks um, bravely, it has to be said, because the, the gunfire went on for you know, a significant amount of time. They were in a strong position defensively, like I suppose Th um, Tom O'Neill had suggested in Clan Mult, um, the, the you know, defensive position has some advantage, but certainly the IRA were in a good position with regard to the gradient in Scarif Town uh, and, and the houses that they had occupied uh, on which to fire uh, on the RIC. But what was critical was that the bombs which had been sent down from Dublin failed to detonate. The IRA had their intelligence organised, they had managed to make their way to the roof uh, across the adjacent Duggan shop that you can see on the left hand side of the, the photograph. Um, but unfortunately, every single one of the hand grenades failed to detonate. It would seem afterwards that the firing pins weren't long enough. They were particularly um, large hand grenades, but uh, it would seem the firing pins, as I say, were not long enough in order to detonate uh, the charge. So that really led to the failure to take over the barracks. And I suppose in one sense it was considered a failure, but uh, immediately or as soon afterwards the RIC vacated the RIC barracks in Scarif, which of course was hugely significant because it now meant that from Woodford uh, through to Tulla over to Killaloo there was no regular RIC presence in North East Clare. And that would be significant for, for many, many reasons. I should mention as well, um, John Joe Fitzgerald, who was the barracks defence officer, had 
been um, shot while he was in Scarif by the local IRA and wounded. He went back up to Dublin where later uh, that year on the night um, uh, of the Bloody Sunday incident, the night before it, he was shot dead by uh, members of Michael Collins' squad. Purely on the basis, it would seem that his name was, Fitzpat- his name was Fitzgerald. They were looking for Fitzpatrick. And um, when the maid answered the door, she informed the IRA men that there was a Fitzgerald in the building. And uh, as uh, Tom Toomey suggested, that that was enough. And they went up and shot him dead. He was a native of Tipperary. But returning back to the 18th of September, now Alfie Rogers, Brod McMahon and Martin Gilday had been identified by the RIC. There was a Constable Connolly in a public house uh, at an upstairs window who was able to see from his vantage point clearly that McMahon, Rogers and Gilday were directing the uh, gunfire and directing the operation within Scarif, being the most senior local uh, IRA men from the town. So from that moment, they became wanted men. And it would seem to me that there was a personal vengeance, certainly, I think, intensified by the fact that they had managed, I suppose, to fool the RIC uh, into thinking that they were, you know, um, carefree sons of businessmen who had no involvement in the Republican movement. But subsequent to that, they spent the following 59 days on the run. Now, they weren't uh, sheltering for that entire 59 days, as I'll explain. It was a very intense period within the community, and I suppose I've tried to kind of figure out what was the emotional atmosphere like at that time. Of course, it became a very dangerous time, as we know. It became uh, dangerous to associate with the police, which, of course, means that there had to be some tacit agreement within the Republican movement that in Scarif Town there would be an acceptance for certain people to maintain a relationship with the police like McMahon, Rogers and Gilday seemed to do so for that strategic reason. But in other parts of East Clare, um, to associate with the police was very, very dangerous as this proclamation distributed by the East Clare area at the time indicates that anyone seen um, answering questions to the police would be shot at sight. Now that was no idle threat, um, even though of course it wouldn't be uh, implemented all of the time and you know there is a certain intimacy I think to the war of independence whereby decisions were made by you know by people on the basis of very very clear local understanding you have a scenario where at one occasion a young woman is coming to this barracks in Scarif uh, bringing eggs to a young constable that she had befriended and Alfie Rogers is made aware of this he invites her to come up to his shop which is only three doors down I showed it to Liz last week from the uh, RIC barracks, he brings her in, he picks her up, he knows that she has eggs in her dress, he sits her down on top of the counter upon which the eggs break and he tells her to go on her way. And as I mentioned in the book, it was a very gentle warning in comparison to what happened to a lot of women who had been doing the same thing. So I suppose that speaks to maybe Alfie's nature, but also to the fact that, you know, sometimes the IRA locally were, were or in many cases, were very capable of making decisions on the basis of judgment and local calls. And, you know, it wasn't a case of a blanket um, implementation of this proclamation, for example. But in certain cases, of course, the IRA were prepared uh, and capable of following through on that threat. This is a woman called Nora Cunahan, who in 1920 uh, is the husband of a man called Martin, who has nine children and whose husband Martin had become uh, known to the local IRA because of his uh, open uh, opposition to the Republican movement. I'll talk through that opposition shortly, but certainly it was enough to draw the attention of the local IRA uh, o- o- until the point of the 27th of October, the day after Terence McSweeney dies on hunger strike, where they take him into custody somewhat. They court martial him. Uh, the testimony of a man called Tom O'Toohey suggests that up until the time that he was executed, he continued to declare that he would continue to demonstrate or to continue to oppose the IRA. 
and to support the British Crown where after the IRA shot him. Now I was fortunate enough to develop uh, correspondence with the grandson of Martin Cunahan. All of his family subsequently immigrated to America and I spoke to his grandson who over a number of years communicated with me about the incident, about the episode, about the impact on his family. And I've looked at it very, very carefully and it is very difficult to exonerate him from the charges of being a spy uh, when you look at all of the evidence. But of, and I understand intimately the, the danger of an informer, uh, which plays out dramatically with the Scarf Martyrs, of course. But also, I suppose, you have to try and you know, look at the human impact of that, whether he was an informer or not. And certainly the family you know, felt that impact um, over the following century since his death and was inherited very strongly by his grandson. Uh, from that time. But what was fascinating to me is that, and revealing I suppose, is that Martin Cunahan was executed on the 27th of September in Fecal, between Fecal and Bedaik, which is only two parishes away from where the Scarif Martyrs were captured. Now, whatever way they executed him, they, or they, they shot him, I should say, he didn't die immediately, and in fact he managed to walk and crawl two miles, uh, apparently with the insides of his stomach coming out and fell into a local public house in the village of Bedaik, where he died. Now, despite all of that, and that being known across the community, less than three weeks later, um, there were people prepared to give information about the presence of, the, of McMahon Rogers and Gilday in Williamstown and Whitegate. Now, that, to me, over many years, has resulted in an understanding that there was no shortage of people willing to give information um, on the Republican movement, and probably for a variety of reasons, uh, which I'll come back to. Between those 59 days, the 18th of September and the 16th of November, Rogers, McMahon and Gilday are on their own, but they're also actively involved in IRA activities, because after the 18th of September, the IRA intensified their campaign in East Clare. On the 25th of September, only a week later, they went into the village of Broadford. Uh, McMahon, Rogers and Gilday are part of the unit. McMahon stays outside to look after a sick IRA volunteer. But, Mac but Rogers and Gilday are in the village when they open fire on a group of RIC, uh, resulting in the death of Michael Brogan. Constable Michael Brogan from a Timon in Galway. Now, ironically, that's only five miles from where Martin Gilday was from in New Inn. And also, there was another man there that night, uh, James Hogan, who went on to fame in UCC as a lecturer of history. He was also there. And in actual fact, he had been appointed a professor of history only a couple of months before that. And after getting his tenure, he left UCC, came back up to Clare, and was involved in the IRA for the following year and a half. Uh, in, in, in the creation of history, I suppose, in some ways. But Michael Brogan was shot dead that night, and um, that was the first RAC man killed in East Clare during the War of Independence. Four days later, in O'Brien's Bridge, Michael Brennan leads an IRA active service unit, which included McMahon, Rogers and Gilday, into the village whereby they shot Constable John O'Keefe and John Downey. Um, in uh, Ryan's public house in the village. And again, they were the second and third RIC men killed in the East Clare area. Uh, Michael Brennan certainly was the leading force of the IRA during that time and from the evidence of people who spoke about it he was uh, determined to take the fight to the British Crown forces during this particular time and it was part I suppose of a broader intensification across the county. Renin had happened uh, only the week before that in North Clare where six members of uh, a Black and Tan and RIC convoy had been killed. So certainly there was a sense in East Clare that you know um, the responsibility there was to intensify their fight. And of course that militarily would have made sense as well because there's no point having all the, the activity in one part of the county because that's where all the British uh, forces will gravitate to unless there's a diffusion of activity across uh, the, the county. Um, on October the 7th, uh, I'm jumping backwards a little bit from Martin Cunahan, but on October the 7th there was an attack or there was an ambush in Fecal uh, wherein two uh, members of uh, an RIC patrol were killed and subsequently the local area was largely burned to the ground by RIC and black and tans 
which again lived long in the memory in terms of the, the viciousness. Of course, two RIC men had been killed, which has to be taken into account. But what it tells you again is that the area has intensified significantly. Now five members of the British forces are killed. By the 27th of October, Martin Cunahan, a civilian, is killed as well. And uh, we see the, the, the war has taken on a, a more deadly form, for sure. During this time, uh, Rogers and McMahon and Gilday having been involved in the actions in Broughford and O'Brien's Bridge, seem to have made their way back towards North East Clare and into the Whitegate district where they stay in a place called Boulinagoo um, uh, for a period of time and eventually make their way to Williamstown House, uh, that I, where, which I will show you very, very shortly. But as evidence of the increased activity in the area. At the end of October, G Company of the Auxiliaries are sent to the Killaloo area where they are stationed at the Lakeside Hotel, which is at, in, on the Ballina side of the Bridge of Killaloo. Now, that's, as I say, a clear indication that the area had become more uh, intense and that more British forces were needed in the area. Remembering that at this time, McMahon and Rogers and Gilday are now moved into Williamstown House, uh, which is on the shore of Loch Derg. You saw it on the map a little bit earlier. Some of the key figures that are involved during this uh, period are the man on the left is uh, Richard John Andrews, the head of G Company. The man in the middle of the middle photograph is J.M. Faraday, who is a, a section commander and would be the man leading the capture of the Scarif Martyrs. The man in the middle of the right-hand top photograph is uh, Patrick Cullinan from Newmarket and Fergus, who uh, joined the auxiliaries at this time and becomes an intelligence officer, and I believe is critical to the whole story. But importantly, on the bottom right-hand side, we see members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, because they, of course, are critical to this story as well, and particularly the man in the left-hand photograph, uh, left-hand corner of that photograph, John Brennan. And Brennan is in East Clare since 1893, he's in Scarif since 1913, and Brennan on the night of the 16th of November is one, certainly, uh, uh, of the men involved in the shooting of the Scarif Martyrs. Uh, three of whom, or all four of whom he knew quite, quite well. It, it's often described as, you know, the, the Black and Tans or the Auxiliaries, but the RIC were centrally involved as well in, in the episode. Williamstown House, as you see here, in its current form, was where the three lads had stayed and where Michael Egan was caretaker. Um, what we have to discuss at this point, briefly, is the whole idea of discipline, similar in some sense to Tlan Mult. Uh, you know, what were the precautions being taken? Now, some points are important. Firstly, this is prior to the establishment of flying columns in East Clare. Uh, so you didn't have that centralised uh, leadership um, that came, I suppose, with, with the group of, of men uh, being billeted together or, or close together. In, in many ways, smaller groups had found it difficult to get safe houses, or at least more difficult to get safe houses by uh, late October, early November 1920. There were dugouts within the area. There were at least four dugouts within the immediate vicinity. Um, but Rogers, McMahon and Gilday chose to stay in Williamstown House, which, comparatively speaking, would have been a fairly comfortable um, uh, place to shelter. And in some ways, it is, you know, they've been described as shop boys, that they weren't prepared maybe to, to endure the type of outdoor um, experience that other IRA men from maybe rural, uh, from farming backgrounds were, were prepared to. Maybe that's unfair. Uh, maybe it's just part of people's human condition. But certainly, they had the option of staying in dugouts, but they decided to stay in Williamstown House. It has been said for many, many years that they stayed in the area far too long, that they had been careless, they were going to house dances, they were travelling around the area armed and openly armed, um, and that they'd taken somewhat of a belligerent attitude. I think all of that is probably true to a degree, but certainly over the space of about 15 years, I've been able to figure out that they did make a, a serious attempt to remove themselves from danger in the closing days, because <clears throat> by around the 11th of November, uh, it, it would seem to me very clear that their, their presence in the area had been noticed. On the 9th of November, Colonel Andrews requests the SS Shannon, a steamer ship 
to take trips on the lake. That was the first time he had requested that. At that point, they'd been in Williamstown for over a week at least. And it, it seems to me that information had came from the area that the three men were staying there and the uh, uh, intention was to use the boat to capture them. Now, within that week, I've been able to discover that they made uh, an attempt to remove themselves from the area. They had travelled, first of all, to Gortini, where the Page family, although were supportive, weren't prepared to put them up because of the danger involved. So they moved on further up uh, towards the home area of Martin Gilday. They went to uh, a family in uh, Shanagari, who... Uh, again, similar to the Page family, were not in a position to look after them. So the only choice they had, having travelled at a point about 20 miles, was to continue on to Martin Day's home place in New Inn. Now, Martin had previously travelled up on his own and had spied on, so he knew it was a dangerous area, but they had little choice at that stage and decided to travel on. Having arrived in New Inn, they again realised that they were being observed and had no choice but to turn around and start uh, the, the journey back down towards East Clare and made their way through uh, Powers Cross where they were seen, through Gortini where I was fortunate to get again another archive tape recording of a man who encountered them during that time. I've spoken to several other people who had oral tradition for them, from within their families uh, who encountered them on the way or had various knowledge of their route that they took. But they certainly um, had travelled a substantial distance. You can see it here on the map from Williamstown uh, all the way up to, to Woodlawn in New Inn. It's a distance of over um, of about 30 miles uh, and uh, 30 back, obviously. So huge distance to travel, some by foot. I've no doubt maybe they, 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 they got... Um, uh, support in some ways throughout that journey, but certainly it was a huge distance. What we do know is that having made their way home, having had no choice but to make their way home, on the 15th of November, they arrived back in to Holland's Yard in Nutgrove, which is close to Williamstown, the relations of Alfie Rogers. And I know from family tradition that they were surprised to see them come back um, that they were not happy to see them come back because I suppose they felt that they were in danger in the area and their cousins were happier that they were away and ostensibly out of danger. But they had little choice than to make their way back. They had been tracked uh, on the way back, certainly through Gortini. There were already seamen soon uh, after their arrival there that arrived into the area. So there was tremendous pressure on the three men uh, throughout that entire journey. They arrived back on the 15th. They spent some time working in uh, Holland's yard. Uh, during that day, they were involved in, in, in winning corn. They took two wheels off of a horse trap, and those wheels uh, have remained in the same place for the last 100 years, um, minded very carefully by the Holland family, who are still very, very proud of their connection. But while they were working in that yard that day on the 15th, a man was seen looking in through the gate and little enough attention was paid to it at the time but obviously subsequently when, when all happened um, that person became very suspicious within the local community. I'll come back to that uh, shortly but while it would seem they were in uh, back in Williamstown information went back up to Killaloo back up to the Lakeside Hotel and the SS Shannon was ordered to be at the Lakeside Hotel early the following morning where 30 auxiliaries got on board, were seen by people in the locality and made their way uh, towards Williamstown in Whitegate on the morning of the 16th. I'm just going to move forward for a second to show you the map again and I'll come back to, here we go. So just to, to give you a sense, um, they travelled from Whitegate on the morning of the 16th of November, made their way to Williamstown. Took about two hours to get there. They landed there about 11.30. Paddy O'Mara, uh, a, a relation of Alfie Rogers, had stayed with them that night. He got up early, went back to his home on island, uh, more off the, the shore of Whitegate. And the three men had remained asleep. And when the auxiliaries arrived into Williamstown Harbour, they had only 100 yards to go uh, to 
get to Williamstown House, which again, if you considered that from the point of view of its vicinity to the lake, it was very, very dangerous uh, to stay there. But of course, this was the first time the British forces had used the lake as a way of moving further into North East Clare. They met Michael Egan. Michael Egan, as I mentioned before, tried to divert them by saying that the men weren't there. Uh, when it was discovered that in fact they were there, Michael Egan was held and was taken captive as well and was taken aboard the SS Shannon. Now, also on the SS Shannon uh, were taken two brothers, John and Michael Conway. We see John there on the right hand side. Now, that is massively significant. Uh, because as we know, the four men were tortured and, and killed. But John, although he was severely beaten with his brother, wasn't killed and went on to tell the tale and was interviewed in the 50s by a minute scholar. And that interview was hugely significant because he gave crucial details as to the circumstances, as to the conditions, as to what he saw and what he heard um, and what he observed himself as being forced to walk out over the bodies that night. The men were brought back to the Lakeside Hotel. They arrived back approximately 3 o'clock, sometime between 3 and 3.30. They were taken into the day room. Uh, a notice was put up on the wall that nobody was to enter, no civilians were to enter. There was a man called um, Joe Hogan who was uh, in the hotel and he heard screams from within the rooms, which he said you would hear in Bird Hill. And uh, as I mentioned, didn't need to go into the room to figure out what was happening inside. John Conway recalled how the prisoners would be brought in rotation into the rooms and each time they came back they would be more bloody and more beaten than the last. So it was very clear that the interrogation was very severe and uh, you know, it's very easy to conclude that the men were tortured. That night, uh, at approximately midnight, the four men were shot dead on the bridge of Killaloo. The reports in the media, or the reports in the press I should say, uh, all ran with the same story that the men were killed while escaping. That was the official account that was encoded in the court of inquiry that took place two days later, uh, which declared that when the four men were taken to the bridge of Killaloo by a seven-man escort uh, led by District, District Inspector Gwyn from Belfast, that they made a combined attempt to escape. Uh, and that after being called on to halt, they were shot and died immediately. That is the official account. And that was presented to the press almost immediately, even within the press. There was, uh, you know, um, a disbelief uh, somewhat as to that being the official actual scenario. There are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, the timing of it, to be brought across a bridge at midnight was a peculiar decision. Ostensibly, they were to be taken to Killaloo where the RIC barracks were held and from where they would be taken to Limerick Jail. The fact that it was a seven-man escort is uh, puzzling when you consider that there were 30 auxiliaries sent down to Williamstown, all armed, when you consider that they were tied with ropes down in Williamstown, they were tied with ropes on the boat when they were brought back to Killaloo, that they were put in handcuffs when they were brought back to the, when they were in the Lakeside Hotel. Yet that night, the official record would suggest that only seven men were detailed to bring four IRA men, as they were described, across. They also suggest in the official account that the men weren't, in fact, handcuffed at that time. So that is peculiar. And in addition to that, you have the you know, huge range of other contradictions, particularly the fact that the official record of D.I. Gwynn was that they were brought for, onto the bridge at 11.45, yet the official record in the House of Commons was that they were uh, shot dead at 12.30, a difference of 45 minutes. The fact that the most amount of blood uh, or the significant pool of blood was found 115 yards across the bridge and when you consider that all of the testimonies declare that they were shot uh, on the Balina side then it would be difficult to believe that four men after being tortured for eight hours would be able to get 115 yards before they were felled uh, is another contradiction. Multiple people including two priests uh, testified to hearing groans, continued groans and interspersed uh, gunfire uh, over a period of between uh, 10 minutes and 40 minutes, uh, as do many civilians within the town. Remember that this is at midnight, this is during curfew, this is over water, 
uh, which amplifies sound. So the oral record is really, really important in that context. But suffice it to say, very few people from that moment, certainly in the local community, believed that they'd been shot through trying to escape, which was enough of a, I suppose, a wound to the community. But what added significantly was that the British refused to release the bodies of the four men until uh, two days after they were killed, during which time they had travelled into Scarif, raided several uh, businesses, including McMahon's public uh, house in which they demanded drink from the parents of the man that they had killed and also sung where is my wandering boy tonight in front of his mother. So again this is all adding to the trauma of the incident. Denim Sparling, the man on the left hand photograph, the heavier gentleman, was Martin Gilday's employer. He went down to Killaloo and was given huge credit over the years in social memory about being the man who managed to get their bodies released. As a Protestant merchant, he I suppose had some cachet that he was able to use. Dennis McMahon in the middle photograph on the left hand side is the brother of Brod McMahon. He also uh, went down to, to try and get the release of the bodies. Edward McLeisett uh, provided his care and support to that as well. Johanna Mac Mahan, the sister-in-law of Brod McMahon, was also down there, but only uh, in, in my research did I discover her involvement. She'd been a nurse in the First World War for four years and had uh, a, a, a knowledge of military law, etc., and was able to confront the British forces with that. So eventually they got the bodies released. They were returned on the, excuse me, on the 18th of November, two days later, on the night of the 18th, back to Scarra, where a huge crowd uh, welcomed them despite the curfew that was in place at the time. Father Sean Clancy from Cool Mean, who was the priest in uh, that community at the time, had of course the job of dealing with the funeral, etc., but also had lived through a very you know, intense week. He had been in Maynooth with Father Griffin, who of course was murdered in Galway that week. His cousin, Pater Clancy, was, was murdered in Dublin Castle that weekend. And his brother was on the run back in, in West Clare at the same time. And, of course, he had to deal with uh, informing the families of the deaths of their sons and deal with officiating uh, you know, what had to be the most intense uh, funeral of his life. The funeral plays a part in the role as well, and particularly in the, in the memory. It was, of course, a hugely significant uh, day a huge crowd. The auxiliaries arrived, uh, the auxiliaries, Black and Tans and RSC arrived as the funeral was taking place. There was huge intimidation of the crowd, even as they were being buried. The Black and, Tan and, RIC, Black and Tans and RICs were uh, pushing at the pallbearers of the coffin. So again, it's difficult in some ways for us to get a real understanding of how tense that funeral must have been, but certainly um, that lived on in the memory. And as I said, was another wound on top of, a, of an already deep one. It, it, it matches in, or sorry, it connects in with the national story. And this is, I suppose, hugely important point to make in the context of what we're talking about at this seminar. In the local is the national, the national is the local, but they, they're speaking to each other all of the time. You have Conor Clune, who many of you will have heard of, uh, who worked in the local community, who was at that funeral that day, and who after the funeral left with Edward MacLeiset and went up to Dublin. The reason he did so was that as an employee of Edward MacLeiset and as a manager for MacLeiset, he took the responsibility of taking the accounts up to Dublin. Uh, to make a return with Edward. But he did that because the man who was supposed to do that, Pat Hayes, had decided to stay in the area because Pat was a member of the IRA. And he stayed in the area to deal with the aftermath of the funeral. So Connor went in his place. Connor was not a member of the IRA. Similar to Michael Egan, from what I've been able to establish, is that Connor was a real gentle type of an individual, hugely committed to the Irish language, uh, refused to speak English to anybody who could speak Irish, but was a real gentle type of a soul. Michael Egan was similar. My grandmother danced with Michael Egan and you know, spoke often about how gentle and shy and, and quiet he was. And I suppose in some ways we have to recognise that human nature comes into these things. Maybe these, these men weren't built for, for, for conflict in that sense. But Connor went to Dublin, as, as I'm sure many of you know, separated from Edward that night, went to uh, Vahans Hotel, wherein he met Pierce Baisley on Gaelic League business 
it was raided by F Company of the Auxiliaries and he was taken to Dublin Castle where uh, the following night he was murdered with uh, Dick McKee and Pat Clancy, of course. So again, as I say, the national and the local is in constant conversation. I want to make, before I make some final remarks, I want to um, draw attention again to the, the folk memory that, that Pat mentioned, you know, that I've been involved in for a long, long time. And, you know, like any source of history, you know, we all have to consider that, you know, what you're reading about, what you're hearing about, um, you know, has to be considered and, uh, you know, has the potential for falsehoods, for subjectivities, for bias. It, all sources have that because all sources uh, come from people and all people have the potential for bias. I'm often confronted uh, by a challenge to oral history as something that's particularly susceptible to bias. Um, but as I, I reply often, I accept it is, but I also accept that all sources come from people. So we have to consider that. But I would put it to anybody, the, the death of, sorry, the death of the Scarf Martyrs, the treatment of them, the fact that 17, no less than 17 bullet holes were found in their bodies, that the bayonet wounds were in their face uh, when the autopsy was undertaken, um, that there were reports, uh, and I found more of them locally, that it's, it's possible that Brod McMahon died at the back of the barracks where they were thrown in a, in a shed uh, only hours later and may have died literally lying on the corpses of his comrades. Uh, you know, all of that sometimes is difficult to, to credit or difficult to believe. I have testimony from uh, the granddaughter of a cleaner in the barracks who was brought out to that shed that I mentioned the following morning by members of the RAC and Black and Tans and told, come out here and look at the fine rabbits we shot last night. And when she got to the door, they opened it and she saw the four corpses uh, thrown in the shed. Uh, so this was, again, these are the stories that we're being told about. And I accept that some people would find all of that hard to believe. But when 10 days later, uh, the Lucknan brothers uh, up in Shenaglish were killed, um, the stories, as many of you know, were, were of tremendous brutality uh, and almost sadistic levels of uh, torture. Um, and they would be difficult to believe if we didn't have the photographs that you see uh, on the left-hand side up there, because they demonstrate clearly the mutilation of the bodies. So we have to accept that this was a, a, a war of intimate brutality, and that, of course, that brutality went both ways, but certainly in the way in which you know, an ostensible police force treated, particularly prisoners during that time, um, is, is important, I think, to underline. So, a few final remarks, um, you know, in terms of it being a, a potential disaster. Of course, at the time it was a disaster. You had three active IRA men killed. Uh, you know, across the entire War of Independence in Clare, that was the most IRA men lost in one incident. You had a civilian uh, tortured and killed. You had the involvement of an informer. You had the involvement, in fact, of multiple informers across the area, which brings in that inescapable dynamic of the conflict. You had the fact that the men did, in some ways, uh, drop their discipline, drop their guard. That's a result of human nature. It's a result of the fact that the RIC had been driven from the area, which may have created a more relaxed environment. It's also the fact that these are young men with guns, you know, who've been involved in actions. That brings a certain amount of bravado, it brings a certain amount of courage um, that maybe led them to take uh, risks that they normally wouldn't have taken. Um, but it also shows that they had listened to the warnings that they had gotten and had attempted to remove themselves from danger only to be pushed back down uh, into the heart of that danger again by uh, people who were observing for uh, British forces. The flying columns had not been established, you know, which again was critical because it meant that you had smaller groups of IRA volunteers effectively managing their own security in some ways across that period of time. But it has remained a hugely significant moment in the landscape of memory and in the historical consciousness of East Clare. It is, I believe, a very important moment uh, nationally during that period of time. It, 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 it plays out across the memory, but of course, like any 
aspect and any episode, there are other incidents beneath that. 13 people, in fact, had been killed by the end of 1920 within the community between the 16th of September and the, the uh, sorry, the 18th of September and the 16th of November. That included, you know, a man who had been 23 years in a mental asylum in Ennis who was shot dead after he ran away when Michael Brennan uh, ran into the to the grounds of the hospital uh, to get away from British forces and included a young 21-year-old girl from Newport who died from a, a brain hemorrhage after shots were fired close to her, her ear only a week after the incident uh, in Killaloo. It involved Martin Cunahan, as I mentioned, the spy who was executed as well. And it also involved the execution of three British soldiers in February 1921, which certainly it could be suggested was, was partly in revenge for what happened in Killaloo. Three British soldiers from the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Regiment had uh, wandered into the East Clare area and had done so on, the, on, the, on their own declaration that they had deserted their regiment. Uh, it was discovered by the IRA that they'd been attempting to maintain contact and they were executed as a result of that. I spoke to a woman um, who was in uh, a house that they came into and she recalled seeing those three men in front of her, which again for me, just to, to finish up on, uh, is another demonstration that in some ways we can reach into our own history and touch it through the memory of our people. And we obviously owe an obligation to research and to understand that history. Um, but for me, if I have any understanding of that time, it's because I've listened and uh, I've tried to, to gain an experience of the emotional uh, understanding of that time. We sometimes look at it chronologically, we look at it in a timeline, we talk about the dates, we talk about the sequence of events because we know what happened after, we talk about the road into the truce, which is I think a hugely important thing to consider, but the road into the truce, if you're looking at that road in November 1920, you have no idea how long that road goes for, you know, before you reach any kind of a destination. So the uncertainty that you know, is part of that experience at that time has to be part of our understanding uh, of history when we explore it. So look, um, I've probably gone well over my time, but I'm really, as I said, proud to have gotten the opportunity to, to speak uh, to you, to talk about this incident and, and its significance both locally and nationally. It's something deeply remembered. The, the small man you're looking at there is actually the great, great grandnephew of Alfie Rogers standing beside his grave back at the 100th anniversary of his uh, death. So, Gramila Mahagav Vileg, Agus Tam Anvich Div Alig. Gramahagav. Just two thoughts that sprung to mind um, during Tomás's tremendous presentation. The first one is, if you like, there's a quotation often attributed to T.P. O'Neill, the former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, that all politics are local. It struck me that particularly in a guerrilla war, all actions are local. And we had a classic example of that in such tremendous detail of the build-up and the impact of the murder of those four men on the bridge at Killaloo or by the bridge at Killaloo. That the local impact before, during and after. And even in a little thing, a little thing that sprung to mind while he was that he mentioned, some of the local people were not too keen on the return of the IRA men because it was a burden. And think of the burden that so many people bore, and bore willingly in some cases, put up with it in other cases, of feeding and accommodating a flying column on the move. You know, we should never forget that. But the other thing that struck me was the power of words. Now, I mentioned at the beginning Lloyd George's words where he encouraged, he not only justified reprisals, he encouraged them and gave the police a carte blanche. And he followed up that, his speech in Carnarvon with the speech at London a month later, the beginning of November, where again 
he more or less encouraged reprisals. And Hamer Greenwood justifying firing wildly. Again, a carte blanche to the police. Now, after the 1916 Rising, the poet W.B. Yeats, in one of his poems, asked, thinking about the plays that he had written to encourage Irish nationalism, he had just asked, did my words send these young men out to die? Well, you could say the same about Lloyd George. Did his young men, sorry, did his words send out young men to kill? Because he had given them free license to go out there and kill. So he had his so His words, I believe, had a lot of power in giving the RIC and the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, etc., the whole idea that they could kill and face no consequence, which also has a message for today. But anyway, moving along, our next speaker needs no introduction whatsoever. So I'm not going to really introduce him. All I can say is that most people who would have produced the magnificent work that Tom produced, the War of Independence in Limerick and the surrounding counties, would be quite happy to rest on their laurels and just show the book and say, I've done that, I've done my part. But Tom has continued on to research and to present and to organize, to help to organize events like this. And all historians, all people interested in the War of Independence owe Tom a great uh, debt. So Tom, to talk about another incident that is new to me until I read his book and new, I'm sure, to a lot of people outside of Limerick will be the Cargill Moor disaster in 1920. Tom. Uh, the last three speakers were very technically off A. You're now dealing with a Neanderthal. Um, to start with the Caja Gilmore, what I call the Caja Gilmore disaster, uh, the IRA in the Brough area, the 3rd Battalion of the East Limerick Brigade, decided to organise a dance for Stephen's Night, 1920. The purpose of the dance was to um, uh, to raise funds for um, the uh, purchase of rifles. The decision to hold the dances it was made mainly by a committee under Martin Conway. Now, Martin Conway was the captain in the Gray, or not the Grange, but the Holy Cross area. A very active um, uh, member of the IRA and very, dare I say, a very brave man. Um, some time before the dance was to be held, which, as I say, was for Stephen's Night, uh, the IRA, or a shop in Brough, was approached by a sergeant of the RIC from Brough. We believed that the sergeant was Fred McGarry. Now, Fred McGarry was regarded as a decent man. He was from County Leitrim. He had been in Brough a long time. He had a lot of respect built up. And he was promoted to sergeant uh, sometime 1920. But it, it appears he went to a shop in Brough, uh, knowing that the shop owner was involved with the IRA. And he said, for God's sake, lads, call off the dance. We know where it's on and we know when it's on. Now, the IRA uh, under Martin Conway, uh, in fairness, took precautions, as they thought, to guard against a raid by the RIC. Um, they had five or six armed sentries patrolling the ground. What they didn't know was that the raid on Cahar Gilmore was organized from the RIC headquarters in William Street in Limerick. It was organized by Captain John M. Regan, uh, who was the county inspector. Now, Regan decided that to guard against 
uh, leakage, a leakage of information. He would not use the British Army. Regan's belief was that um, British soldiers were going out with local women and that that's where uh, a leak would, would occur. Now, as I say, uh, the IRA knew about the potential for a raid, but they didn't believe the extent of it. Um, about 30 years ago, I interviewed a man, uh, Mikey, Mickey Condon, in Fedmore. And Mickey told me that on that Stevens night, himself and his brother were out uh, feeding pigs. About 8 o'clock in the evening, when a convoy of 15 lorries drove up past their house and stopped about 100 yards further up at what's known as, as the Taylor's Cross. Now, the Taylor's Cross would be about six miles across country from Cahagillamore. So, as I say, the, 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 uh, it was obvious they knew what the, the dance was on and that it was going to be raided. Um, the first inkling that the IRA had, uh, or the people inside at the dance had, that something was untoward was um, shadows seen moving in the distance. So the word went out that all IRA men on the run should get out. The feeling was that anyone that wasn't on the run, you know, that they were relatively safe, that um, uh, nothing was going to happen to them. However, Jed O'Dwyer, who was one of the men on the run, uh, Jed had a revolver on him. And his friend Ned Maloney said to him, give me the revolver, he says, you won't need it, you have to get out. So Jed, uh, his, brother, uh, his brother and um, Martin Conway, uh, his brother Nicholas and Martin Conway, they went out, there was a, a, an escape route made ready, but said they had a ladder up off the kitchen garden wall. The three lads got up onto the kitchen garden wall and jumped down. And while they were waiting to figure out what they were going to do, a lorry of tens free wheeled down the, the avenue. The three lads uh, uh, jumped up and ran across the field. Now, uh, sometimes when you hear things, uh, you know, you, you wonder, did it happen? But in this instance, the testimony given me by uh, Jed O'Dwyer was confirmed by a uh, black and tan by the name of Bemsden, who he was driving one of the, he was driving the lorry. And he said, as he refueled down the avenue, three fellows rose up from the side of the avenue and rush, ran off across the field. Now, the tens opened fire. Gerard Dwyer was shot through the hand. His brother Nicholas uh, was wounded over a year. But Martin Conway, unfortunately, Martin made the mistake of running for a gap in, 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 in a ditch. And of course, uh, the silhouette would be seen and the tans opened fire, and Martin was mortally wounded. Um, now, there's rumours as to what he, you know, uh, how he died. Some say that he managed to struggle on across country, and that the tans had uh, hounds, and that they tracked him with hounds. And when they got up with him, they finished him off. Uh, another line of uh, says that. He was brought back into the into the uh, into the house, into Cahagilmer House, and when they discovered his, who he was, he was finished off. Um, the first man, uh, first victim, there I said, as such, was um, Harry Wade. Harry Wade was uh, uh, one of the sentries, and. When he saw shadows moving towards him, he challenged the, the shadows. But unfortunately, uh, the shadows were, as I say, black and tans and RIC. They opened fire, and Wade was uh, mortally wounded. Now, he wasn't, a, he wasn't killed as such. He wasn't killed outright. He died the following day in the, the hospital test in the military barracks in Sarsfield Barracks. Um, a number of other men were shot, uh, there were sentries, uh, Daniel Sheehan from Grange, 
John Quinlan from Loch Gore. Now, Quinlan was an interesting character because he was back from America and he had joined the IRA and he was one of the sentries involved. Um, th the next man was Ned Maloney. Now, Ned Maloney is um, an interesting case. He was a very good friend of Gerard Dwyer. And when Dwyer was told to get out, you're on the run, get out, um, uh, Maloney prevailed on him to hand over his revolver. Uh, Dwyer gave Maloney the, the revolver. Now, Maloney as such had never been in action before that. And um, when he saw the tents coming around the corner, he opened fire and he shot dead Constable uh, Alfred Hogsden. Now, whatever hope there was for um, there was a, a civilized search before the shooting of Hogsden, uh, uh, Ned Maloney's action uh, got rid of any hope of uh, a peaceful resolution. Now, Maloney then followed O'Dwyer, uh, the two O'Dwyers and Martin Conway. He went up the ladder onto the kitchen garden wall. As he got to the top of the wall, Hogson's um, uh, comrades opened fire and um, Ned was shot dead. Um, now, in addition to the numbers that were uh, that were killed at Cahar Gilmore. Another, a number of others um, were seriously wounded. Now, we've already mentioned the two other wires, as I say. Uh, Jed was shot in the hand, and Nicholas was wounded over the year. Bob Ryan from Loch Gore. Now, Bob Ryan was a Fianna Fáil TD in later years. Bob Ryan uh, was also wounded, but I think he got away. Um, now, the next and probably the most tragic uh, case is that of Dr. Michael O'Brien. When Hogson was shot, the, uh, the uh, police and military prevailed on, on O'Brien to give him medical uh, assistance. Now, obviously, uh, uh, Hogson didn't matter what medical assistance he got, he was mortally wounded. And um, when O'Brien was finished giving assistance to Hogsden. He was given a desperate, a desperate beating because uh, he was perceived as, um, because he had a medical case with him, that the, in other words, that he had been prepared for, uh, a dare I say it, for action. So the um, Tans, as I say, took it out in O'Brien. Now, as such, he doesn't appear as one, as one of the uh, fatalities at, um, at uh, Cara Gilmore, but he died when he was released from prison. He died two years later. He died in 1923, and he's buried uh, at Cahanari, um near Limerick. Um, Frank Nealon from Brough. Frank got a very bad beating as well. Uh, he, he was um, released early because his health had failed. Now. All the males, once uh, Ned Maloney had fired a shot, whatever hope, as I say, for uh, a peaceful resolution of the thing, um, all the males at the dance, and there were about 140, they were all given bad beatings. Um, there, was 100 women, there was 100 girls at the dance, um, whilst they were rounded up and searched. Uh, they weren't, dare I say, they weren't interfered with in, in any way. Um, in, in addition to uh, Frank Nealon, uh, I've included Martin Conway there, but he was, as I say, fatally wounded. The other person that was badly wounded was Pat Canaan, Patrick Canaan from Crean. Now, Pat's family are still in the Crean area, but he was also, as I say, uh, uh, wounded at Cahill Gilmore. Um, he was in prison in England for a while, and he was released. Now, in total... 60 prisoners from Caha Gilmore were given long-term sentences in England. Um, some interesting characters throw up in it. Uh, one of them is um, Josie Toomey from Balaniti. Now, Josie Toomey is not a relation of mine, but who he was a relation of was uh, Constable Michael Enright. Josie Toomey was a first cousin to Michael Enright. The RIC uh, man that was shot here in Knock Long in May 1919. It's amazing the way the little uh, connections fly around. Um, 
the photograph there shows uh, Nicholas O'Dwyer and, and Jed O'Dwyer with their mother and their sister. Now, as I say, um, the two O'Dwyer brothers were wounded at Cahill Gilmore. Um, the, all the prisoners, all the men were rounded up and they were taken to Limerick. Now, a number of, um, as I say, 60 men were tried and given long-term sentences in England. Two, uh, uh, there I said, Tommy Conway from Carnan in Fedmore and uh, Martin uh, Mulcahy from Herberstown. They were uh, two sentries that were actually um, captured. They weren't shot. Like. Of the sentries in Cahill Gilmore, three of them were killed. Uh, the two boys um, managed to, dare I say, it, stay alive. Now, Tommy Conway is interesting because Tommy played Railway Cup hurling for Munster uh, for the first four years of the, the, of the Railway Cup. As I say, his um, family still live at Carnan in Fedmore. Um, and he did, while he was in Spike, he did uh, an autograph book, which turned up only about five years ago. Um, the, as I say, it, this photograph shows three men that were at um, uh, Cahill Gilmore, uh, Jed O'Dwyer, uh, Dick Fitzgerald, and um, uh, Martel. Now, Dick Fitzgerald was one of the men that spent um, a long time he got a 10-year prison sentence in England. The fourth man in the photograph is um, Liam Hayes. Now, Liam Hayes was a father to Seamus Hayes, and even to her, any person that was into show jumping. Uh, Seamus Hayes was an international show jumper back in the 60s. Um, Liam Hayes, as I say, was his uh, father. Now, Liam Hayes, uh, when that photograph was taken, had 10 fingers. <laughs> um, he was wounded at Drumkeen. He was the only man wounded at Drum, in the Drumkeen ambush in February 1921. And uh, there I say it, uh, he got a finger, uh, a thumb and first finger uh, uh, taken off with a, with a bullet wound. Now, the chances are that the, wound, the bullet wound that Liam Hayes got at Drumkeen was fired by a comrade from the other side of the road. But as I say, that was Liam, Liam uh, Hayes. Um, sorry. I think there's a slide missing. Jesus. Uh, keep going. That photograph shows um, uh, Joe Wade. He's a, a, a brother to, younger brother to Harry Wade. Now, Joe Wade lived up to, he lived to a great age. He died about 20, about 20 years ago. Jed O'Dwyer died in 19... Uh, 96, as I say, he was wounded at Cahill Gilmore. Uh, he died in 1996. Um, he was 97 years of age when he died. Uh, so unfortunately, I think there's a, uh, I must have wiped some slides. Uh, that's not Cahill Gilmore. No, I'd say that's somewhere Cahill, New York. Um, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> the upshot of Cahill, or of Cahill Gilmore was that the third, the third battalion of the East Limerick Brigade was effectively neutralised. Um, 140 men went to the dance. Uh, probably about 10 to 15 escaped. Now, there were 60 men sentenced to long-term prison ter terms in England, uh, I, in various prisons in England. Um, in Tom O'Neill's ex uh, excellent book on Spike, uh, he lists 30 men. So that's 90 of the, of, of the male attendees. Now, I reckon there was another at least another 25, 30 people um, that would have had maybe just a couple of weeks or a month prison sentence. Uh, one interesting character that was um, Martin Clemens from Kahanari. Martin Clemens was a, a battalion quartermaster in the Karakalish Battalion 
of the IRA. But he was fortunate in the sense that the fox covered for the Limerick hounds was on their land. And his father went to Colonel Michael Fornell and he convinced him that his son was an innocent man who only went to a dance and didn't know where he was going. Uh, but as I say, uh, Corn Fornell, who was a colonel in the uh, British Army in the First World War, went into William Street Barracks and he pleaded his case. And Martin Cremens, uh, as I, say, I think he was in for about a day or two, he was left off. Now, as I say, there would be very few cases like that. Uh, as I say, overall, um, I would reckon that out of the 140 men that attended, attended the dance, uh, there would be over 100, well over 100, about 120 that were arrested. As I say, the um, 30 that Tom O'Neill has and the 60 that were in, in, um, the 60 that were in long term, as I said, it would be others that only serve maybe for a week or a fortnight. Um, I don't think you have any more to say. Except for us some slides. Thank you very much, Tom. There's no doubt about it that the strength of the IRA was in a sense that it was of the community. It was in the community and had the general support of the community. It was their greatest strength. But was it also a weakness? Imagine holding a dance in the middle of a war and getting the warning from the local constable of the community and going ahead with it. Was it a weakness, that sense of overconfidence, the sense that the community are with us? You could say the same, maybe ask the same question about Clan Mould and about Williamstown House. Was there this, was it, as I say, the greater strength that they were of the community, but also potentially a weakness because it give, could give rise to overconfidence or carelessness and so on like that. You know. Now, any questions? Okay, Chairman's privilege, I'll ask a question. Clonmouth, Targillamore, uh, the Scarif. In each one of them, we saw the importance of intelligence. Also, how you control intelligence, if necessary, shooting informers and so on. What struck me, and this is a question for Liz, the, the sheer scale of the operation for the Customs House the weeks of preparation, the planning, and yet it came as a complete surprise. Or did it come as a complete surprise to Dublin Castle and to the British authorities? Sorry, you want to take a microphone there, Liz? Is that there? Um, yeah, well, they didn't help themselves because there was, um, there had been a military uh, guard in the custom house. Uh, the 4th Battalion the previous September had gone in to raid the, the weapons um, and they removed the guard a couple of weeks prior to the actual event. So it played right into the IRA's hands. Um, so they were, they were caught off guard and I think the bigger surprise though came in the aftermath of the custom house because it looked on paper not only have they got 100 fellows of the, the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, but they also have wanted men, members of the squad, members of the active service unit, and they're the guys that go to Mount Joy and they think they're, they're over. We've, we've neutralised Dublin and sort of let's focus now on the counties and, you know, they get confident and literally that night the IRA are back out. Um, so they didn't help themselves by removing the military guard. Maybe it was that air of the confidence. There had been an attack on one of the barracks as well in Dublin City. So the guard is sent over there. That's another reason for it. But they play into the IRA's hands um, and certainly the aftermath where the IRA prove that they weren't decimated really um, shows the lack of intelligence that the, the British had against the numbers and strength of the IRA and their capabilities. They, 
I think that's remarkable that, in a sense, it says that any informers in Dublin must have been at a very low level. That's something that involved so many of the Dublin Brigade went unnoticed, the preparations for it on that. Um, I'd like to ask the other three, Tomás, Tom and Tom, a, a question about their opinion about the Customs House operation. Because in a way, you fight a war, and like a guerrilla war, you fight it on three levels. There's the intelligence war, getting intelligence and stopping the enemy from getting intelligence. There's the military side, but above all, there's the propaganda side, selling your case to your people and to the world. You could say that the Customs House was a propaganda triumph, but not as great a disaster as has been proposed or has been said in the past, but it was a defeat for the 2nd Battalion of the Dublin Brigade. Overall, was it worth it? The question for Tomás and the two Toms. Tom. Milita uh, militarily, I would have thought that it was a very risky operation for what was at, at stake, which was really just burning records and a a sort of a token attack on the authorities and on the, uh, the governance of, of Ireland at the time. And it certainly was very risky to be op operating with so many volunteers in Dublin. It certainly decimated the, the second battalion. On the other hand, the argument is made that it amazed the British military authorities that the IRA could muster so many men on a mission and that definitely sent uh, a major ripple effect through Dublin Castle that despite all the, um, th those that had been captured prior to that, that so many men were operational uh, at that stage. I suppose looking at back now of course, people are so disappointed that so many of the Irish records were destroyed in that operation. Oh, what do you think of this? Um, my, question, uh, my question over the um, Custom House operation, right? Why didn't they do it at night? Liz, would you comment on that? Curfew. Curfew. How do you mean curfew? The only people... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you have the, the curfew in place, so the only people that were to be out on the streets would be the military. And the only, so there's a huge risk of guys getting arrested if they're walking the streets at night. Um, so I suppose you could then say that, well, why didn't they sacrifice maybe two men to, to go in and start a fire in the building? Yeah. Um, but also, the whole thing De Valera wanted was a spectacular. And in the middle of the day, that this event could take place, a huge, huge attack. Um, it, did, it was to generate that, um, that attention, that focus. But curfew as well would have been a huge, huge problem. You couldn't have all of these men simply going around Dublin and attacking because you could risk actually losing the whole lot more. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would have thought that if they had a number of men going into the building during the day, hide, hide themselves mm. and open up after, after hours, and that it wouldn't take a whole lot, you know, it wouldn't have taken a whole lot, in my book, uh, to bring in petrol and burn the thing at their ease. They needed you there in the planning, Tom. <laughs> 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 I don't think anyone thought of that. <laughs> Uh, Morris, I leave you to referee that. <laughs> uh, look, I, I just think, uh, I think part of, the, just come to Tom's point there and Liz's response, like part of it I think was to, to make that public statement, you know, so I think 
doing it during the day, while it might not have been, a, I don't know, a conscious decision in that sense, but certainly they wanted to do something public. And part of that, I think, as well, is, is to, to, to deal with this kind of attack on the credibility of the Republican movement as a legitimate um, army, as such. Because this battle for the narrative is really, really important and has become more important, particularly because, what do you know, you're almost a year into de Valera's tour of America, which was about legitimacy, about recognition at that international level. So demonstrating the capacity publicly to strike at the heart, you know, symbolically of um, British rule, you know, or at least a, a, a really significant representation of British rule in Dublin, as in the Customs House, that's really, really important. And I think at that point, you mentioned propaganda, Pat, that has become so important at an international level, you know, to, to, to rail against this constant narrative of this, you know, murder gang who don't have the support of the people. But if you can do that, you know, in the middle of the day, you can, you can, you know, have the organizational capacity, the discipline, the wherewithal to go into a, a building of that institutional, you know, significance, take it over, burn it down. Um, that's a real response to charges of illegitimacy uh, that were being made constantly against the IRA. So uh, I think that's partly, you know, part of the, the, the dynamic. Anybody want to comment? See, in some ways, it mirrors De Valera's comment that shooting a policeman made no headlines outside of Ireland. Burning the customs house made headlines all over the world. He was focusing on the propaganda battle. You know, it's just a matter for discussion. So anybody else, any comments or questions? Yeah? Uh, Tim Ryan from Galbally. Just uh, well, kind of came up there as well. I think an old British major said to me one time, he says, all wars are propaganda. And you just mentioned it there about America. And I think we cannot underestimate the effect and that the America had in our history, even up to the modern day. And the thing that De Valera did when he went to America, and there was a lot of want to be political at all about it, but it had a fantastic effect. My family were highly involved in the War of Independence, as Tom Toomey will be able to tell you, but one of them was a priest abroad in San Francisco. And the, all the incidents that were happening were appearing in France, one of the main papers in San Francisco. And the influence that this had in America. And one of the articles that appeared when my uncle was shot in, in, in St. Thomas Street in America, a big article appeared in the Francisco, uh, the San Francisco, I think it was the Times at the time, that Father Scanlon's brother was murdered inside in Limerick. The effect that this had in America, and America was terribly important in it, and when I came back to the original point, that all wars are propaganda, and I think we won the war in propaganda, especially in America. So that what they said about burning the, the four courts and all this sort of thing, propaganda was terribly important, and I think the IRA at that stage won the war on, on, on the propaganda war, and it was terribly important in, in the final result. And just one other incident that Tom Toomey is terribly aware of and written about, the drunken ambush coming towards the end of the, of the fight as well, had a huge uh, influence in the propaganda war, where was it 11 of the RIC, Tens were shot in Drupkeen, and all that was injured was the, the wireman that got his finger blown off in the Drupkeen ambush. And that had a huge influence as well. It was that point, thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, just on that, I think. The propaganda is, is so, so, so important, uh, not just for the public, but I think also for the, for the troops themselves, for morale. If, if, if the public in general don't believe that uh, what, what the, the soldiers are doing is correct, then 
the, the, the soldiers themselves are going to lose the battle. I think from the British side, it was very important for them to try uh, to win the proper propaganda battle. Uh, a lot of the soldiers, some of them, and, and, the, and the policemen would have been Irish men. Uh, and if, if they, so the British had to, had to win the propaganda, propaganda war. That was, and I think that's why, I think there's a, also, uh, there's a parallel to what happened in the North in the, in the last while, I suppose. There were a lot of very emotional times in, in the troubles in the North, but probably the most emotional time was the time of the hunger strikes. And that was all down to uh, Thatcher saying on one side that they, these, were, these were, were criminals and that the, the hunger strikers had to go to so, such lengths over a long period of months to try and win that, that war. So that was a very strong, and I think propaganda is just, it is the centre of the whole lot of it. What people believe is, is, the, is vital. And that affects the, that has a knock-on effect on the troops on, on both sides, on, on, on the soldiers on both sides. I think it, you're absolutely right. The propaganda war is important, particularly when you have a small nation fighting an empire. Propag and the British put in a huge effort from their side of the propaganda war, but it failed miserably. And there was one noted incident in that propaganda war where the British staged a so-called ambush. An armoured car, a couple of tenders, appeared to come under fire, the truce dismount and heroically drive off the attackers kill most of them, capture the rest. And this was, this, according to the script on the film, which was a silent movie, of course, took place near the town of Tralee in County Kerry. The only problem was, it was very quickly exposed that was staged on the Vico Road in Kalini. And my God, if there was one place, say, any place safer for the British troops to do a film, than the Vico Road in Kalini, I can't think of it. But the propaganda, but there was also another aspect to the American side. The Americans had financed the British Empire during the war. And the American banks were looking for the loans to be repaid. Throughout the 1920s, the British were trying to renegotiate the loans and trying to renegotiate a loan with an American bank I believe is next to impossible. But they certainly did not want the propaganda, the black news, that the dark side of the empire being portrayed across America at a time when they're trying to negotiate with American banks. But you're right, the propaganda war was huge on both sides and certainly by any standard the work of people like Desmond Fitzgerald and er Erskine Childers and others they won that war decisively. The, the Irish won that side of the war decisively. And that's a, that was a very important achievement. Sorry, I don't know if anybody... Can I just maybe just add there? Uh, Pat, you know, like, there's two sides to propaganda, I think. I mean, I agree completely everything that's been said. Uh, and it became more and more important uh, as the war went on and as it became more and more international. And there are incidents that, that play out so dramatically in that sense, in terms of even funerals, like the funeral of Terence McSweeney, the funeral of Tomás McCurtain, because not alone have you the, the death and the nature of, let's say, McSweeney's death, which I agree with that man in terms of the, the connection with the hunger strikes and the way it taps into the emotion, right? But, like, propaganda operates at an international level or a national level, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily linked to the experience. It's just how it's presented and how it plays out. But you have to also look in at the actual experience on the ground. And what I think is important to acknowledge is that, of course, not everyone was in support of the IRA. Of course, there were people who were against it. There were people who were, you know, very, very passive. But there, the level of support was very, very significant. The level of, of willingness for people to endure the very, very, really rough experience of supporting the IRA in any way. Some of it unwilling, some of it willing, or less willing, we put it that way. But I think that has to be understood, because for every you know, incident that became a propaganda piece, there was a real effect on the ground. And the, the willingness of communities to endure all of that, or at least 
many of them within the communities to endure all of that because of their broad support of the Republican agenda uh, remains very, very significant. So we, we always have to connect with the actual experience on the ground. And I think in some ways there's been an attempt within you know, historical circles, cir circles in the last 20, 30 years to, I suppose, challenge the support that actually was there for the IRA. And, you know, while we have to challenge everything, I don't think it's possible, it would ever have been possible for the IRA to execute the campaign that they did without a significant level of support uh, across the country. So, as I say, we, we, we need to acknowledge the, the significance of the propaganda, but the propaganda uh, is rooted in actual experience, which, which always has to be significant. You know, that support, that strength in the community was the key thing. The IRA was of the community, it was in the community. It was our greatest strength, but also could be a weakness. And sorry, Pat, just to yeah. add on to what Tomas has said, as in just for the personal experience, because the newspapers, if they were allowed to print what happened. Um, you know, it is t generally people dying and stuff. You, you don't really get the, the people who survived, but the Labour Commission, the American Commission, that's where you get those stories. And they're online. Um, just, just, I think it's Oroctus, you have them. And um, the American Commission and the Labour Commission look them up because you're getting the stories at a local level. It is tribunals, investigations, but where the ordinary citizens are asked the questions, asked about their experience, um, it, it's a fantastic resource for, to add to that story. It's not propaganda, this is actually a proper investigation being done by Americans and um, British alike. Well, I think We've had a wonderful day's history, a wonderful day of history. And as I said at the beginning, it was a wonderful title, The Rocky Road to the Truce. 1921, the violence, the killings just got greater and greater. I mentioned at, my, at the beginning, November 1920 being a bloody month with 176 fatalities in that month. But in 1921, February 175, March 216, May 237, June 223, and in the first 11 days of July, in, before the truce, another 108. In those six months, just over 1,100 people died in Ireland. In the, build, in the rocky road to the truth. And that is about half, just over half, of the total number of people killed between 1919 and 1921 in the period of the War of Independence, including those who were killed on the streets of Belfast for sectarian reasons. It was, there were executions in the intelligence war, something like 180 people, including three women, were shot for allegedly spying for the British forces. That was the part of the intelligence war. And I'd like to leave you with one question. It's almost at the, one of the what ifs of history. Were all the killings, the violence of 1921, was it necessary? And I asked that question because there was a little known episode in, that, in December 1920. I mentioned again this idea of November being a bloody month which changed the war. It became far more of a military conflict. British Army taking precedence in the counter offences. More troops, more equipment, martial law, internment, court martials leading to executions within days. But I also said that for the first time Lloyd George and the British government began to recognise that they could not win the war, that sooner or later they would have to talk to Sinn Féin. 
and the opportunity presented itself in December 1921, sorry, 1920, in December 1920. Archbishop Clune, Archbishop of Perth, a native of Clare, had made what they call in the church his ad limina visit to Rome. Apparently all bishops have to do this every couple of years. And he took advantage of his travel to Europe to take a break and to visit his parents and his family in Clare. And he was there in September during the Renine ambush and the reprisals that followed that. And his nephew, Connor Clune, was one of those killed the night of Bloody Sunday in Dublin Castle, along with Dick McKee and Paddock Clancy. So he knew what the War of Independence was like. And he had street credibility with the Irish. But he also had amazingly street credibility with the British government. Because he had supported the uh, British government very strongly during the First World War. He was made Chaplain General of the Australian Armed Forces for the Catholics there. And there was a lot of them. He supported the introduction of the proposed introduction of conscription to Australia, even though Archbishop Mannix opposed it. Lloyd George looked upon him as loyal. On November the 30th, on his way back to begin his journey from Southampton to Australia, there was a farewell dinner for him organised by the Irish Parliamentary Party in London. And at the end of the dinner, Joe Devlin, Irish Parliamentary Party MP, asked him to postpone his return because he said Lloyd George would like to talk to you. The next day he had a meeting with Lloyd George and Lloyd George asked him to investigate the possibility of a truce. He was surprised, he travelled to Dublin, he met Griffith and Collins. Griffith was in prison. He was brought in to see him. He met Collins. Had De Valera was on the high seas coming back from America. He had several meetings. And for a period of two weeks, he was involved in shuttle diplomacy. Back and forth. And he soon realized that Griffith and Collins were amenable to a truce to be followed by negotiation. And Lloyd George was amenable. And they had more or less agreed on the terms. Until at the last moment, our old friend Winston, Winston Churchill, along with the Army McCready and Hamer Greenwood, introduced two new conditions. One, the IRA had to surrender all of their arms before the truce. And secondly, that in whatever talks followed, Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy, as described by Churchill, the leaders of the murder gang, could not be part of any delegation. Of course, when he went back to Dublin with those new conditions, Sinn Féin, the IRA, just said, forget about it. He tried again for a few more days but could not move the British. And the prospect of a truce be just before Christmas in 1920 collapsed because of these additional conditions and the hard line taken, partly because McCready promised that the army would have the Irish problem solved in six months. And as we saw, as I said from the figures, they certainly didn't. They went back, he went back, the talks collapsed. He returned to Australia convinced that there was a real opportunity just before Christmas 1920 for a truce. And the very terms that he had agreed were the terms that were agreed in July 1921. A lost opportunity. 
There mightn't have been any rocky road to the truce in 1921 if the talks had proved successful in 1920, in December 1920. But that's one of the what ifs of history. I'd, I'd like to talk, I'd like to thank, first of all, the committee for organizing this. It was fantastic, as I say, to be here. I'd like to thank in particular the audience and to all of those online. Everybody contribute to making it. And in particular, our four speakers, Tom, Liz, Tom, and Tomas, and that. And just to thank everybody and to wish you safe home. And as they would say, Gomermi Bjor Naum Shorish. Here's to not, uh, not long 2021. Thank you very much.